Wow, it's so quiet. <laughs> All right, well, good evening. Uh, I'd like to call the regular meeting to order. It is six, a little over six, and announce that the board did meet in closed session and no action was taken. I would also like to announce that tonight's meeting is being recorded and will be available on the district's YouTube channel. I would also like to announce that cards are available at the table just outside of the boardroom for anyone who wishes to address the board. If you wish to address the board, please complete a card and hand it to a staff member at the table to my right. Please be sure to complete the card indicating whether the matter you wish to address is on the agenda or not on the agenda. If the matter is on, if the matter is on the agenda, we will assume you wish to speak when it comes time to address that item on the agenda and we'll hold your card until that time. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Charlie Price from Elliott Ranch Elementary School, being accompanied here by Principal McNeil. Mr. Price will, is uh, going to be leading us here in the, pre uh, in the pledge, and, but before that I would like to read some wonderful things about this amazing man. And again, it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Charlie Price, Elliott Ranch grandparent, volunteer, and yard supervisor to lead us in the flag salute. He is joined by his grandson, Jeremy, who now attends Elizabeth Pinker Pinkerton Middle School, but did attend Elliott Ranch in his elementary years. Charlie has been a volunteer extraordinaire since Jeremy was in kindergarten. During his eight years of service, Grandpa Charlie has led math and reading groups and made copies for any teacher who needed help. Mr. Price is also known as Mr. Fix-It, because, <laughs> because if there is a physical need on campus, Charlie can always be counted on to step up and offer help. He has, with his own finances, bought the materials to make individual whiteboards for hundreds of our students. Anything that breaks or needs replacement out on the playground, Charlie tackles from basketball nets to tetherball clips. He has also helped fix screens and build our school garden. Charlie worked at Home Depot for 21 years and he used his connections to get donations from not only Home Depot to support our garden, but also visited local businesses to seek donations to support our PBIS initiative to offer incentives for our uniform and caught, and caught you being good tickets. A way was found to get Charlie on the payroll three years ago as a yard supervisor. He is a wonderful blend of old school, high expectations and caring concern for all of our first through sixth graders during recesses. He is a valued member of our PBIS team and works on the front lines assuring that all students have a caring and bully-free place to play. His latest endeavor involves using his skills in leather work to support our school. He donates his own resources to make bookmarks and bracelets for incentives for students, and he makes items for all of our staff as well. We have a small club on campus that has been selling Charlie's leather works to raise money for the SPCA. Charlie is the type of volunteer that principals dream about. Mr. McNeil has enjoyed working with him for five years and has known him and is, on, and is honored to recognize him for his contributions to the Elliott Ranch Rockets tonight. On a personal note, Charlie is a tenacious racquetball player and great exercise motivator. Thank you so much, Charlie. All right, if we can get everyone to rise and please remove your hats. Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Charlie, would you like to say a few words? No. <laughs> okay, stay right there. I'll say a few words on his behalf. Uh, Charlie is really an amazing volunteer, and we're very fortunate to have him. I was a little nervous when Jeremy left us to go to the middle school uh, that he might leave us, but he hasn't yet. He absolutely loves our school and does um, 
amazing work to support all that we do. He's actually taken his own resources and made a, a bookmark for each of our board members and superintendent and Ms. Hine uh, with the Elk Grove District logo on it. So he wanted to make sure that you got that and thank you to him for that. And you know, I'll add a few comments as well. I've known Charlie, I, I'm a former Elliott Ranch mom, and just the dedication that he has shown and the pride that he has for the school and for the children. He's sort of everybody's adopted grandpa, and it's just so wonderful to have him there. So it's just wonderful to recognize such a dynamic and charismatic human being. Thank you. So Charlie actually just um, bestowed the board here with wonderful bookmarks with our names on them, part of his handiwork. So thank you again, that's wonderful. How about another round of applause for this great man? <laughs> All right, next we have high school student representatives. First up is Florin High School. <laughs> It's okay to clap. <laughs> Good evening, President Singh Allen, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, and Ms. Hine. My name is Kirsten Van. I am this year's ASB president at Florin High School. Good evening, my name is Mari Cruz de Gu, and I am this year's ASB Vice President. We are excited to announce that Florin High School has collected over 2,500 pairs of jeans in the Teens for Jeans drive, and we would like to thank all of those who helped us in reaching this goal. As you, have, as you may have heard, Florin recently voted to move to block scheduling next year. As a result, we are having our first ever electives fair this Thursday and Friday, and will showcase new electives such as African American Cultural Studies, Survey of Astronomy, and Sports Psychology. Florin High had their very first academic and winter sports blacklight assembly last month. During this assembly, we recognized our top 10 honorees, honorable students, and those who passed an AP test. The purpose of this assembly was to demonstrate that Florin is a high-achieving campus. We also had a lip sync contest between our staff and admin team in which our very own Miss Lewis sung California Love by Tupac and killed it. And of course, we had, our, had a performance by Masterpiece Dance Company and our Hohana Club. We ended the assembly with a mind-blowing performance by our FHS drum light where it rained neon confetti and the on-end screen for an encore. ASB received high compliments from the staff, including a statement by teacher in charge, Mr. Pedersen, who stated that this was the best assembly he has seen in over 20 years. We are looking forward to our Kaleidoscope Assembly, which we celebrate the, the diversity of our campus and which we would like for you to join us on April 17th. Our winter sports did exceptionally well. For the first time in 12 years, our men's basketball team qualified for playoffs alongside our women's basketball team, who for three years have consecutively qualified for playoffs. The wrestling team also had a very successful season this year. Seniors Isaiah Weathers and Sean DeVisher complete, competed at the California State Championship for the men's tournament, while DeAnthony Green and Laylee Lemons competed for the women's tournament. Florence Spring Sports are also off to a great spot, sorry, um, start. The men's tennis team enjoyed their first victory in the preseason match against Elk Grove High School with a score of eight to one. Our baseball team is also doing well with a record of four to two. 
We would like to invite you to join us at our open house on April 16th. ASB is currently partnering with our academic departments to develop a Dr. Seuss themed event. In addition to having ac academic activities that highlight our scholarly achievements, ASB has asked each department to choose a Dr. Seuss book. We are creating activities tied to these books in an effort to increase the number of participants from our community at our open house. We would like to take this opportunity to share with the students the wise words of Dr. Seuss and remind them of all oh, the places they'll go with a good education. In addition, the Florin High School Theater Company will be presenting their edition of The Breakfast Club from April 9th to the 11th at 7 p.m. Come join us to watch our amazing actors bring this classical film to life. With only two months left to school, our seniors are more excited than ever, especially from hearing back from some colleges they have applied to. Collectively, our Florin High seniors have earned acceptances into Sacramento State, Stanislaus State, San Diego State, San Jose State, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo State, Chico State, East Bay State, San Francisco State, Long Beach State, UC Davis, UC San Diego, UC Santa Barbara, UC Merced, UC Santa Cruz, UC Riverside, Notre Dame University, and Willamette University. We would also like to thank the Siemens Corporation for awarding five $1,000 scholarships to our seniors. We will celebrate these acceptances along with our scholarship recipients at our Spring and Senior Awards Night on April 28th. We are excited to announce that we have over 800 students who are receiving academic awards. Lastly, we will honor seniors with awards given by each department. This is a momentous occasion for us and we will be honored if you, if you could attend. And as always, don't forget that you know, and I know, that every day is a great, great day to be a Panther. Panther. <laughs> Great report. <laughs> All right, next up is Laguna Creek High School. In the spirit of St. Patrick's Day, top of the evening, President Sing Allen, ladies and gentlemen of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, and Ms. Hine. My name is Noah Majorin. Uh, and I'm Braden Trotter. First off, we would like to wish everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, as winter gives way to spring, Laguna Creek is bustling with excitement for the athletics and extracurriculars, and of course, academics. With the halfway point of, sorry. With the halfway point of March comes the return of college applications, especially from the various University of California campuses, which is an equally nerve-wracking and exciting time for our seniors. At the same time, Laguna Creek students just wrapped up their third term of the year last week, and the campus is buzzing with excitement to be on the home stretch. But the year isn't over yet, especially for our AP and International Baccalaureate program students who prepare to take exams this May and who hope to attain the diploma, certificate, or some college credits to take with them next year. We would like to wish all these students good luck. Recently, IB seniors took a trip to San Francisco to visit a few museums to study and learn more about the African diaspora and Harlem Renaissance that sparked and immersed many of the literary artists with which they have spent the, year, the, the last year studying. In other news, the program continues to work with Harriet Eddy to establish a middle years program, which will prepare students for the challenges that they will face as an IB candidate. Laguna Creek has also been one welcoming other future Cardinals during shadow days in which a young student who is interested in Laguna Creek is paired with an upperclassman that he or, he or she shadows for a day to experience what it is to be a Cardinal. As for off-campus outreach, students took a trip to elementary schools across El Grove for Read Across America Day last Friday to encourage these future leaders to find the value and fun in books. And of course, this term we are taking the CASP. The excitement at Laguna Creek is also buddy, buzzing outside the area of academia. With the winter sports all wrapped up, we would like to congratulate our wrestlers Traymar Moore, Benedict Juan, Mansoor Amadi for making it to Masters this year, as well as our girls basketball team who, after a rough start, made a comeback season and managed to pull above 500. Spring sports are in full throttle. The girls soccer team made their record 3-0 tonight in their game against Sac High. They have been doing great this season, featuring a hard-won exhibition victory over Kasumnas Oaks. Our swim team also looks forward to a promising season, with individual swimmers and relays qualifying for sections in just the first practice meet last week. And of course, our softball team, 
who are looking forward to a league title and maybe more this year. We would also like to congratulate Tim Fortier in taking first place in last week's golf tournament. And off the field, students are getting excited for this year's junior and senior ball held April 11th. We also would like to invite you to a few of our upcoming events, including our spring play this weekend, Happy Days, a production about a boy who escapes into a dream world of the 50s. Other events upcoming are our Academic Awards Night and Senior Awards Night on the 23rd of April and 14th of May, respectively. Thank you, and we look forward to giving you another update this May. All right, great. Thank you. Another great report. And last, but certainly not least, is Calvin High School. Good evening, Elk Grove School District. My name is Dehana Trail, and I'm speaking today as a proud student of Calvine High School. I would like to take the time to inform you of how Calvine has affected my life. Attending an alternative school was never an ambition of mine. I doubt as much of anyone's. However, attending Calvine has taught me not to be afraid of a mere title, look past society's definitions, and experience things for ourselves. And I can honestly tell you today, my experience at Calvine has been inspiring. I'll tell you why. It's comforting to know you have the complete attention and full support of your teachers. A famous quote by Jack Welch, a former business executive, says it best. He says, before you are a leader, success is about growing yourself. When you become a leader, success is about growing others. And that's what I see through the staff of Calvine High School. They're leaders that have devoted their time into helping their students grow mentally and academically. The staff at Calvine is remarkably unwavering. I had pitied myself for having to attend an alternative school due to change of school districts. I told myself this wasn't my fault and I didn't deserve this. But what I did deserve was the authentic support of my teachers. And that's something I never felt at my previous schools. And that's something that every student deserves and that's exactly what Calvine offers their students. I never thought to actually partake in affairs involving my school or community. However, I knew I wanted to be a part of something that was beneficial to my personal life. So I was glad to have been a part of leadership this year. It inspires me to see young people put forth effort into not only making their school, but their community a substantial environment to live in. Now, Calvine doesn't have football games, homecoming rallies, enthusiastic cheerleaders, or occasional school dances and all that good stuff. But however, we are far from unfortunate. Calvine has first participated in activities that allowed us to give back to our community and also perform certain events that would benefit the student's personal and academic life. Calvine has participated in a multitude of events. In the month of December 2014, Calvine participated in a kids' canned food drive. They have also participated in chips for kids in the month of November and December. In October, we had an Elk Grove clothing drive as well as coats for kids. Calvine has also had distracted driving awareness, which informed young people on the dangers of being distracted while driving, pretty self-explanatory. Um, also, we have had events that informed on the dangers of smoking, such as tobacco awareness posters that we hung up around the school that was done by the leadership class and Don't Buy the Lie. One of the upcoming events Calvine has is Pennies for Patients, which donates money to blood cancer research. And in April, we have our blood drive, which we are looking forward to participating in. For the students of Calvine, we have Junior Achievement. Junior Achievement gives quality information on career planning, goal setting, and character building. Another program Calvine has is the Lynx Mentoring Program. The Lynx Mentoring Program is a program that focuses on helping students with life skills, academic success, conflict resolution, job seeking, and exploring educational options. And another program that Calvine offers is the ACE Program, which is an architect career program that allows students to explore the demands of being an architect. They have recently been working on a structure of a new school building, which I'd really like to see. <laughs> they have um, ROP courses that are taken in nearby local high schools, which allow students to experience what it would be like in their desired career field. And these ROP courses also go towards students' credits. And these are just a few things that Calvine does. Calvine is very small. However, the anticipation and dedication to get involved with the community is great. Being here has taught me to be a leader, not for the benefit of just myself, but for the benefit of my community and my peers. I'm proud to say that I finished early and I will be graduating from Calvine this year. For me, this school wasn't just another high school or an alternative school for credit recovery. It was a school that was a team of both students and teachers working towards success. I'm excited for my future now that I've learned a valuable lesson. 
Being a leader is not just about running and taking charge of things, but giving yourself for the benefit of others. If you have the power and the opportunity, then use it for the benefit of others. Thank you to the teachers and staff of Calvine that have given me strong motivation, and thank you so much for this opportunity to speak on behalf of Calvine High School. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Alonzo. I am a senior at Calvine High School. As I wrote this speech, honestly, I was still in shock that I was given the opportunity. Thank you, Calvine High School and its amazing faculty and staff. With that being said, good afternoon. It is a privilege to be standing here before you, giving you a glimpse, or as I like to say, a look through the eyes of a student. During the first week of September, everyone returns to school with many expectations, some good, some bad. Speaking for myself, I was in the middle. McClatchy High School was where I originally had started. Three years of high school and feeling established, having friends, family, and always to be broken. In my junior year, my counselor broke broke the news to me that I was a little behind in credits and that I would have to leave and could only be back when my credits were good. I was devastated. Soon after, I was moved to homeschooling, soon followed by another rock in my road when I learned that we were moving. Just my luck. I had just begun homeschool and as quick as I started, it was also going to an end. My sister, a former Calvine High School student, spoke to me and gave me some great advice. Never would I have imagined it would have led to me to where I am now. Her advice was, go to Calvine High School. School isn't always about being with your friends. Sometimes you have to think about yourself. She was right, and I'm glad I listened. At Calvine, the teachers, staff, and students are the best. They encouraged me to keep going. They never let me give up. They guided me on the right path. Calvine's teachers helped me focus and be on track. Ever since I entered Calvine, I noticed a change, not just on my grades, but also myself, in a good way. I'm so grateful for what Calvine has done, not just helping me, but helping others too. At Calvine, we have many activities. For example, blood drives, penny for patients, chips for kids, kick butts day, distracted drivers awareness, don't buy the lie, the whole school year collecting clothes and donations. We also have mentoring programs such as links and aids to help students plan their future. Calvin helps you out, but you have to put your part in it too. I learned that I control my future. I am thankful for what Calvine High School has done to help me graduate on time. Thank you for your time. Fantastic. You know, those are some of the best testimonials I have ever heard for the importance of Calvine High School, so congratulations to you. Um, I'd, at this point, I'd like to recognize our fantastic principals. Um, we have Don Ross, principal of Florin High School. <laughs> Doug Craig with Laguna Creek High School. <laughs> and Mr. Joe Arosa with Calvine High School. Thank you so much, and students, you may be dismissed. All right, um, next on the agenda, we have the Academic Decathlon Student and Teacher Recognition. I would like to call on Ms. Charlotte Fennessy to assist, and with uh, board members, uh, Dr. Martina Zaleri and uh, Beth um, Albiani as well. I think there's a, a lot of certificates, so two would be good. President Bobby Singallen, members of the school board, Superintendent Chris Christopher Hoffman, and Ms. Hine. The Board of Education is asked to recognize students and coaches who earned recognition at the 35th annual Sacramento County Academic Decathlon Competition. The 35th annual Sacramento County Academic Decathlon Competition was held on February the 7th, 2013. 15 at Endercombe High School. A total of 26 teams from area high schools competed in this all-day event. This year's theme was New Alternatives in Energy, Ingenuity, and Innovation. As a background into the academic decathlon competition structure, student decathletes participate as a nine-member school team against other schools. Each team consists of three honor level decathletes, a 3.75 to a 4.0 GPA, three sch scholastic decathletes at a grade point average of 3.0 to 3.74, and then three varsity decathletes from a 2.99 GPA and below. Students take a 30 minute multiple choice test in the subjects of economics, language and literature, 
music, science, art, mathematics, and social science. In addition, each team member presents a planned four-minute speech, a two-minute impromptu speech, participates in a seven-minute interview, and produces a timed essay. These academic decathletes coached by local high school teachers not only grow in academic achievement, but also learn about teamwork, goal setting, planning, and leadership. This year, three Elk Grove Unified School District's high schools placed in the top 10 among competing schools. Those schools are Pleasant Grove High School, third place overall, Sheldon High School, fifth place overall, Laguna Creek High School, seventh place overall. As a result of their third place finish, the Pleasant Grove High School team has earned the right to compete in the state academic decathlon competition to be held on March 21st at Natomas High School and the Memorial Auditorium. Also competing in the event this year were teams from Elk Grove High School, Franklin High School, and Monterey Trail High School. The board is asked to recognize members and coaches of these top 10 teams and to commend students and coaches from other district schools that receive medals and or team leadership awards. Tonight, we're going to ask the academic decathlon coaches or principal from each school site to assist us in recognizing the students from their school. I'd like to begin with the coach from Pleasant Grove High School, Melinda Hatfield. Hello. Um, I just wanted to introduce the kids and I'll let you know some of the awards that they won as they walk in. So first is uh, Jai Wei Lin. Uh, and then Twee Down. If we can have you go through the front, the reception line right over there, great. Uh, <laughs> Keon Tran earned a civil, or silver medal in science and math. <laughs> Owen Finney uh, earned a gold medal in speech in language and literature and economics. He also earned silver medals in music and super quiz. He earned bronze medal in art, and he was the uh, first overall decathlete in the county. <laughs> Vincent Nguyen received a silver in science. <laughs> Tanya Nguyen received a gold in interview, bronze in essay, and bronze in language and literature. Martin Hernandez earned the Team Leadership Award, third or bronze in music and super quiz, uh, silver in speech, and a gold in language and literature. Uh, and our two of our students couldn't be here today, Kyle Osborne and Kyrie Davis. Thank you. This time, I'd like to announce the Sheldon High School Academic Decathletes. We have Rebecca Costueva, who won our Team Leadership Award. Thank you. 
Ryan Roberts, who won a silver medal in math and a bronze medal in economics. We have Sharon Dingabisi. Morgan Folgers. And Lynn Fan. Well, our coaches couldn't be here, uh, Julie Christian and Justin Souza this evening. Um, they did a great job with our kids this year. And so we finished seventh overall, and we have five of our students here to, tonight. So first we have John Long. John was our top scoring team member. He silver medaled in uh, social science, bronze medal in science and interview. Uh, our team leadership award went to Garland Yee. Our other team members here tonight are Kai Ellison, Ian Garvey, and Brian Lee. Good evening. From Elk Grove High School, I'd like to recognize David Cabezas, our Team Leadership Award winner. And Matthew Now, the top scoring team winner. And Jerry Strong, who won the silver medal in math. Good evening. From Franklin High School, we have Coach Matt Falcons. He was unable to be with us tonight. We have student Cassie Yin, who was the Team Leadership Award winner.
Good evening. I'm from Monterey Trail High School. Coach Kevin Williams couldn't be here tonight. Um, I have assisted with Monterey. I was team mom, and I've been just promoted to assistant coach tonight. Uh, my name is Eva Nelson, and I would like to announce uh, our top scoring team member and our team leadership award is Karina Nelson. Does that conclude? Is that all? That's all of them, right? Yeah. All right, how about a round of applause for all of our wonderful students? <laughs> Congratulations, you make us all very proud. All right, I'd like to announce that item number seven, request for student expulsions, has been moved to just prior to the consent agenda. Which leads us to LCAP. Um, I'd like to call on Mr. Mark Cerruti. Good evening, President Singh Allen, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, and Ms. Hine. I appreciate the opportunity uh, this evening to provide you uh, another LCAP update. Um, and this evening, um, as we always do, we ground the work in our LCAP in, in E4 um, with a, attention to our district's learning vision, every student learning in every classroom and every subject every day, with the ultimate outcome being all of our kids being college and career ready upon graduation. Um, and we use that learning system to guide our decision making, our thinking, and our planning. Our four strategic goals um, that were developed last year uh, that guide also um, not only our thinking and our planning, but our programs, services, and related expenditures. The goal we've got related to high quality classroom instruction and curriculum, we've got a, the second goal that focuses on the assessment uh, of students with a focus on a comprehensive assessment approach that includes formative, summative, and interim assessments, as well as programmatic um, assessment and evaluation. Wellness, which has a focus uh, on our students' uh, physical and emotional safety and also involves um, the assurance of uh, school uh, adequate uh, facilities and safe uh, physical spaces for our children, and lastly, it's the assurance and our need to ensure that we're uh, including our parents and community as uh, direct partners in our educational endeavors. And the last slide that I'll um, touch on is the upcoming uh, planning and work we'll be doing directly with the board. And uh, you'll see there are four uh, upcoming dates in April. We'll be busy in April. We've been busy up to this point. And just to, uh, again, assure the board that we've been continuing to do work, meet, meet with our various stakeholders. Last week, we had a terrific opportunity to meet with three of our bargaining units where they came and met with Superintendent Hoffman and members of the cabinet um, and shared their interests in areas of priority that they see for our district moving forward, um, both within the context of LCAP, but also um, in general, in terms of directions we should be going. And so I do want to thank Maggie and her team who were there, as well as Mary and Nancy um, and, and their team, and Tony Manaletti from uh, Piswa was with us, and then we'll be meeting again with uh, the remaining bargaining units tomorrow afternoon. Um, and there was a, uh, as recently as last evening, there was a uh, foster youth, Mr. Steinhauer and his group had a meeting with the foster youth advisory group. So we continue to gather the feedback and perspectives from our constituents and we're gathering and synthesizing that information to assist in our thinking and our planning. That first meeting in April 
um, will be working with the board to provide a bit of, uh, of overview. We all want to always want to ground our understanding in terms of the process of LCAP, and then we'll provide uh, the board some background data in terms of uh, student and programmatic data. Then we'll take a look at the current stakeholder uh, feedback summary. So we'll provide for the board uh, a summary of that information and that data. And then we'll take a look at strategic goals and emerging themes that are coming through and align to those strategic goals in, uh, in terms of interests and areas uh, of interest from our various stakeholders. I do want to point out and just remind the board in terms of, of data, this first year of being there, there's the standard data which we continue to track. Um, CELT scores, um, Casey scores, things of that nature that we continue to have. In terms of some of the programmatic initiatives that we, we, under, uh, that we uh, underwent for this year, uh, I always think of data in terms of three separate entities and its input, its output, and its outcome data. Inputs and outputs. Inputs are things like planning. They can be money. It can be time. Outputs are things like programs and services, and outcomes are the results of those programs and services. And a lot of the data we'll be looking at initially is st starting to gather benchmark data in terms of, of programmatic uh, evaluation, but a lot of what we're looking at are the inputs and the outputs um, uh, up to this point, and so as we will be discussing with the board and if board members have specific questions in terms of results of various programs, in some cases uh, I'm sharing with the board not making any excuses. We may not have results at this point in time, what we would provide for the board in terms of student outcomes, what we would be able to do is share with you the structures, the, the, the practices that are in place, uh, programs that are in place, the metrics that are being gathered, and we'll provide for you a status report along those lines. Um, on the, uh, and both on the, on the 7th and the 21st, it it's, uh, should be understood, but perhaps not everyone understands in the, in the room. Those are, board, those are actual board meetings where we'll be using time at our board meetings um, to engage in LCAP discussions. And then there are two workshops on the 14th and the, and the 22nd where there's more um, time set aside for the board to uh, discuss, plan, decision make. Um, as we work through it, the process is such that we'll be bringing information to the board, bringing recommendations to the board, and we'll just be working toward a deeper understanding of, of interests in terms of programs and services based on student needs, and the other is we'll be working with it in the context of, uh, of our ongoing budget development. And so with that, I'll respond to any questions um, or comments that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Cerruti. Any of my colleagues have questions or comments? Mr. Perez. Um, March the 13th, I sent a letter to you, Mrs. Ms. Chairman and, and Mr. Hoffman, regarding the new LCFF Title V Education Regulations, Chapter 14.5, Subchapter 1, Article 1. I requested the presentation on this new LCFF Title V uh, regulations. And um, Chapter 1, or Division 1, California Department of Education, Chapter 14.5, Local Control Funding Formula, Subchapter 1, Local Control Funding Formula, Spending Regulations for Supplemental and Concentration Grants, and Local Control and Accountability Plan Template, Article 1, is a local control and accountability plan and spending requirements for supplemental and concentration grants. What I requested, how do the regulations impact on this year's 2014, 2015, and next year's 2015 and 2016 LCAP plan? That was on my number one question. And also, please include in our board of, please include this in our board of education. March 17 presentation. So if we cannot have that today, can we have that agenda item for April 17th? Mr. Hoffman? Well, I believe I responded to that uh, 
in an email um, requesting, because you actually had that and a number of other items that you requested information on. So I believe we have a meeting set for the 23rd where we can actually go through that information and make sure I clearly understand the expectations and then we will uh, move forward in working with Ms. Singh Allen. I think this, the, the, this the is not together. only one uh, board item concern. I think this is a concern of all, all of us as boards. Uh, a lot of times we make decisions without pertinent information and that has been the past practices of Elk Grove Unified School District. We do not get enough information and data and so what I'm requesting as a board member that we have some kind of in-service training and updates on new regulations that were from the Department of Education uh, that are new and they have a fiscal impact in our, in our budget. Um, let me just say that I disagree with your comment that we are not provided adequate information. One, you are speaking on behalf of everyone, and I like to think that those who do have questions or concerns can and will speak up for themselves. So if you have additional questions and concerns, um, I do appreciate that you did send the email, but I also was copied on the correspondence between the superintendent and yourself um, to have that meeting and get the necessary information that you need. So I, I look forward to having that meeting and- Yes, I did not request questions. the meeting. I requested information to be presented to us as a board and also to the community out there. Our parents do not know the new regulations. So we're, we're, we're providing information, transparency to our parents, our students, and our labor uh, uh, community. It's so based on the information that was provided to me in the email, there wasn't enough information there for me to be able to determine what was going to be on the agenda. That's why I asked, I emailed you four times on four different topics, including this topic, to set up a time so we could sit down, discuss the situation in detail so I fully understood your request. Okay. I did that multiple times. Okay. Point number two is that I had sent copies of the regulations, a report from the Department of Education, I think, or Ed, Ed Source, to be duplicated to give to all board members and staff members. I, re I called up this morning, or this afternoon, asked if that was ready to be uh, given to board members. They said that they would talk, talk to you if that is possible. So it seems to me information is not getting to uh, us as board members, and, and I'm not sure why because you haven't taken the time to meet with me yet. But like I said, I think it's, a, it's a information that all, we should all share and be knowledgeable about it on the same page at the same table. So to, maybe to put this um, discussion to rest, let's have that meeting so that there is a meeting of the mind. So there is clarity on all parties of what exactly the request is and what the ultimate uh, purpose is for the sharing the communication. So I look forward to having that meeting like, as well. I would like to have that regulation sent to all board members, number one, so, and number two, and also to whoever else you may think that may be pertinent. Thank to. you, Mr. Perez. Or, Anybody else have questions or comments on uh, the LCAP update for Mr. Ceridi? Hearing none, we will move on. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. And uh, we do not have a budget update, so moving on to public comment. I do have one speaker card here, um, Ms. Catherine Duran. I'm going to try and get through a few minutes. You, you, can you give me a few extra seconds? Um, we do have protocol. We unfortunately, we just have the three minutes. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to read then. Okay. Okay. One of the arguments in favor of Common Core has been, well, we're lagging behind the rest of the world in science and technology. That claim falls under the new non-offensive term, mistruth. Um, every district that's adopted standards is now working on transitions which push algebra mostly into ninth grade, compressing three years of math into two, greatly reducing the number of kids that can do calculus, but enabling some students to go uh, to take calculus in 12th grade. Is that important? Trevor Packard, Senior Vice President of College Board, said, calculus is in conflict and lies outside the sequence of the Common Core and further. The calculus is not part of the Common Core sequence and in fact, the Common Core asked the educators to slow down the progressions for math. 
Jason Zimba, lead writer for the Math Standards, admitted that it's a fair critique that it's a minimal definition of college readiness. And it's not only not, it's not, only not for STEM, it's not for selective colleges, nor are they capable of preparing them for any selective four-year college, even in a non-STEM discipline. Author of Massachusetts Standards and the highest ELA standards in the country, Stan Dostrotsky's response to Mr. Zimba, suggesting that it's not okay to, quote, call something college ready when it only applies to a certain kind of college and a lower level of mathematical expertise that won't buy you far in the international market. She should know, as a Common Core Validation Committee and the only teacher and ELA content expert, along with Stanford University Professor James Milgram, the only mathematician on the, and math teacher on the Validation Committee, both of whom refu refuse to validate the standards. Will the current proposal for in integrated math work well for 21st century kids? Do the can standards do what they say they will do? Where is the evidence? Um, this, uh, two, there's a 2004 Auburn University meta-analysis revealed the following. Students who, who took calculus were 25, 28 times more likely to be high achievers in post-secondary work and that the level of math taken, regardless of the factors such as race, socioeconomic status, the type of high school, was the largest indicator of achievement level. Success in college increases by 2,800% with the ability to do calculus. But guess what? You must master calculus in order to major in STEM. Will bad things happen when kids, and will kids suffer um, in any way from Common Core in the assessment? Special needs students, um, the assessments present a civil rights violation. The standards and assessments are developmentally inappropriate, most egregiously for K-3. Standards narrow curriculum. When standards in, are attached to high stakes tests, teachers do not teach what is not on the test. Parent participation is low at the federal government. As the federal government steals more co local control, parents continue to lose their Ma voice in education. Mr. Ann, lose time. I still have seconds here. Uh, over. It's, it's, that's over. That 15 seconds is okay. over. Is so I have a request. Can I put that in? I'm sorry, you have, a re you have a request? I have a request. I have a request of the board. I'm, I have a recommendation for the board. So may I read that off real quick? Um, if I would invite you to submit your um, testimonial so that we have benefit of having all of it. Okay. Um, and if you want to submit your request to Ms. Hein to share with the board. I will do that. I will put it in uh, an email to... Okay, that's fine too. Oh, great. All Thank right. you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, next up on the agenda, bargaining units. I'd like to ask if any of the bargaining units wishes to address the board. Good evening. Good evening. Board President Singh Allen, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Ar Ms. Hine. I am very pleased to announce that our TA passed with 97%, which um, is, is probably one of the highest we've had in quite, quite a long time. So this starts a, a new um, path for us to see how our membership reacted to such a comprehensive TA. I look forward to seeing the board's um, discussion or hearing the board's discussion this at, at later on in the agenda once it's presented to you. Um, I'd also like to say and, and reiterate what uh, Sorry, I'm working on a few hours sleep last night. I was working a little overtime. Um, when Mark said that we met about the LCAP, it, it has a different energy now when we are meeting together. It is a very open and forward-thinking discussion where there doesn't seem to be anything holding us back other than what we may put the chains on ourselves. So I want to thank Superintendent Hoffman for Chris for our lively discussions. They're always very thoughtful and provoking, and I think it bodes well for the future of our organization as we work together and create more TAs that are looking just as nice. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. Anyone else? Yes, no? All right, thank you. And moving on to item nine, 
Water conservation, Mr. Pierce. Thank you, President Singh-Allen, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Hine. Uh, Mr. Hoffman and I thought it would be a good idea to share with the board the current state of affairs relative to the drought that I know we are all painfully aware of as a state, uh, but more importantly for you and for the community to also understand and appreciate what that means for us as a school district and the measures uh, that we have to take. So this will actually be the second year in a row, unfortunately, that I've had to share with you some measures uh, that we have to take as a result of being a school district and the number of uh, play fields and whatnot that we have. So I have some facts and figures about us as a district that you may or may not be aware of that you might find um, quite interesting given our size. But I will share with the board that uh, I believe us to be the most visible consumer of water in our region. We have a number of school sites, as you know. We have a number of fields, and I am often taking calls and emails and uh, people questioning about water and what we're doing and I know you as a board sometimes uh, get those emails and those questions from people so we hope to share information with you to empower you to be able to address some of those uh, but also just to share with you that, that we're doing our part uh, to conserve water as a school district along those lines I can kind of share with you a, a funny story perhaps but uh, at the start of this school year and, and, and I'm somewhat kidding, but it's serious, and it kind of makes the point um, that on this issue, we really can't win. And there's a lot of need for our facilities, both um, for our teachers and our students, but also our community relies very heavily on our field. So first day of school this year, I had two emails that morning, um, one from a, a, a very concerned citizen that was using our fields on Sunday, and this person was actually very upset with the condition of the fields and their perspective and how dry the field was and that was it or could it be deemed unsafe because of the, of the nature of the field. And then on that very same morning, I got an email from a concerned teacher who lives in the city of Sacramento who was concerned with how nice the fields looked and what about the drought and uh, you're watering too much. So my point is it, it's a tough um, issue for us uh, because we have concern at both levels and it's something that, that you'll be hearing, I promise you, as we move into the spring and the summer months uh, because the drought will have a, a bigger effect on us um, just naturally because of the heat and the length of the day. So again, California right now, uh, December 31st of 2014, marked the fourth year in a row of consecutive rainfall levels that were far below average. So we are now in the fourth year of a severe drought uh, I find this fact to be somewhat frightening. Uh, 2013 uh, was the driest year, calendar year, on record in the history of California, only to be surpassed by 2014 as now being the driest year on record in California. So that, I, that's a big deal, right? I mean, the water is so important to our state and, and how arid it can be. And you'll see some facts about the reservoirs in the next bullet. Uh, but right now, snowpack levels are at, on a statewide average, we're at 17 percent at this point of the year uh, where we historically have been. So there's not much hope in filling those reservoirs in the next bullet um, as that snowpack melts. So we are going to enter another summer and another year, in my opinion, of a drought, probably making it the fifth year in a row of a severe drought situation. This goes back to December, or January, excuse me, of 2014, um, when Governor Brown declared a drought state of emergency. And there hasn't been a whole lot since then because nothing's recovered. In fact, things have remained the same. It was quickly followed by State Superintendent of Public Instruction Torlickson um, establishing a drought reprieve for California schools. And he started a Save Our Water campaign, which we adhered to as a district. And then in April of 2014, and uh, I think this, it, it's kind of an odd uh, quote, but I put it in quotes. It says, redouble state drought actions. And that was a directive from the governor um, in, in, by virtue of an executive order, which is not an insignificant uh, matter. And then in August uh, 1st of 2014, there was a stage, tr um, stage two drought restriction that went into effect. And some of the details I'll share with you tonight are different um, than our restrictions that we had last year. 
So quickly, uh, watering facts for our district, we have over 1,200 acres of irrigated landscape throughout our district. Um, irrigation needs far exceed drinking and building water needs. We often hear about uh, things, you know, leaky faucets and drinking fountains, and they are important, but you can see from these numbers that in the buildings themselves, say for an elementary school, we're only using 10 to 20,000 gallons per week. I say only. Uh, because that's in perspective to how many gallons we're using right now just to irrigate a typical elementary school, and that's 200,000 uh, to 400,000 gallons per week. And then middle and high schools can be upwards of 2 million gallons uh, per week for irrigation. And so the difference for us as a school district compared to maybe our homes and our front yards and our backyards, in many cases those have just become traditions. Um, your front yard for the most part is an aesthetic. I mean, how often do we really use that, that front yard? Uh, but our fields and our play fields are actually an educational component of our delivery. They're required by the California Department of Education. At the elementary level, they're just as critical as they are at the middle and high school level. Again, notwithstanding how our community also uses those fields. So drinking water and building water is not the big concern for us. It's irrigation. So these are some facts that you may not be aware of. Uh, most of our sites do use domestic supplied water to irrigate the fields, but we do have 11 school sites where we're using ground or well water to irrigate the fields. When this all began last January, uh, they weren't so concerned with well water and where we use groundwater to irrigate our fields. But now as those aquifers have dried up, um, they are being um, regulated similar to domestic water. And then we have three elementary school sites that use reclaimed water to irrigate their sites. And again, because of our size, we actually have six water agencies that serve us. And all of those water agencies have their own boards. They have their own requirements and restrictions that we have to adhere to. And then district-wide, we only have four irrigation techs in-house that cover the entire district and deal with those issues. So half of our school sites, these are really the more... Um, the more recently built schools, if you will, are on centralized control systems, and that means someone in a office can adjust the sprinklering of those fields. Um, but the other half are on standalone systems where someone has to go out in the field and make adjustments to those um, systems. And each one of those takes about 24 man hours um, just to make adjustments to. So to give you a feel um, for where we're at, in the city of Sacramento, in that water district, we're down to two days a week in watering, and it depends on the address, if they're even or odd, which days we water. Um, Elk Grove Water District, we're also at two days a week, um, very similar to the city of Sacramento, but they're different days. Uh, Sacramento County Water Agency is actually allowing us right now to water three days a week, and we are taking advantage of that at the school sites um, where that's allowed. And then I spoke to the governor's mandate earlier, and as a state, he's asking all of us um, to reduce overall water consumption by 20%. I can tell you that the irrigation restrictions that our local water districts have applied to us, that we've cut our water consumption by far more than 20% um, just by changing our irrigation practices. So we're fully complying with that. So we're working with all the regional counterparts, not just the water agencies that we work with, but also um, CCSD, for instance, and how they're going about this. I'm working with other park districts and how they might be meeting the needs, even um, golf courses, and how they're meeting their local needs. Um, as water needs increase over this spring and summer, we won't be able to change our practices. So we'll be watering this summer in the same fashion that we've been watering over the winter. Um, so you can imagine um, what that means for our fields. So as we mentioned already, we're watering two or three days a week as mandated depending on the um, agency. And then sites with reclaimed water won't be as affected. Reclaimed water is not turned on yet if, as far as our fields are concerned. But as we get into the spring and summer months, as we're, when we're using the reclaimed water, they actually want us to use it. So they will ask us to water more often than we are now. And so as a board, you might hear, for instance, that a Joseph Sims might look better than a John Earhart. And why is that? And that's simply because Sims is watered with uh, reclaimed water and uh, John Earhart is not. But we, we don't want to penalize them um, and keep those fields in, in as good a shape as we can uh, because they are reclaimed water. And I think we should take advantage of that, and we would do so. 
So we talked about um, sites that are irrigated, irrigated with uh, wells. We're going to continue to reduce those by 20%, but again, um, it's far more than that because we're treating them the same as we are domestic. We have an added emphasis right now with all of our custodians uh, to report leaks and any waste that they might see immediately to the maintenance and operations department, and then they are making it a priority to repair any leaks or faulty faucets, fixtures, et cetera. And then our irrigation technicians right now, really the priority for them is to deal with the repair of sprinklers, overspray, uh, leaky valves, and watering. To that end, custodial staff is asked to monitor it as well and submit timely work orders if they see any overspray, any overuse, or any leaks. Uh, groundwater level monitoring is required at a higher rate than it was previously. So we have uh, two water quality control technicians who work with all of our, our wells and they're having to do increased monitoring of the height of those wells right now. And then we have signage and posters at all of our school sites, um, whether it be in restrooms, break rooms, et cetera. And then I talked about the uh, more frequent water surveys for irrigation systems. So for a board and, and for the district as a whole, uh, depending on the restrictions moving forward, um, the water levels this summer and spring, they're not going to be at a level that, that allow plants to thrive. It just will allow them to continue to live. Uh, I don't say that lightly because our fields, again, not only are required, but they're huge, expensive assets. They really are. They're property, and we have to ensure um, that they're maintained at a level that we don't lose the asset. And so we have um, worked with our local water agencies. I think it's a concern even at a state level um, because they're required, because there's something different than those um, aesthetic landscaped areas that you see. We've asked for some variants. We've asked for some, for some leeway. We haven't been granted that yet. And what I mean when I say that to you is our school sites, mainly middle schools and high schools, they're so large that there's also time restrictions. So you might only be able to water on a Tuesday, but they fix the time and the hours of watering. So a large middle school or high school for us, when that first um, system will turn on at say eight o'clock when we're allowed to start watering, that entire site will switch over from one phase to the next. And it might take all morning until five in the morning to hit every piece of the, of the site because water pressure um, just isn't there to allow every valve and every sprinkler to run at the same time. So there's, a, there's a, a timeline associated with that, and the hours of operation don't allow us to even effectively water a large high school, even on the day that we're allowed to water. So we've asked for some variance there. But even more importantly, we can be better off as a district if we can still water, say, every other day for a limited amount of time as opposed to water a heavy amount of time twice a week and you get a lot of runoff in that circumstance. It doesn't allow the, the ground to absorb the water as it does if you water um, more frequently but for a lesser duration. So we're continuing to work with that. But you can anticipate as I do, um, we will have some community and staff members who express frustration. There's times when we have to water say on a Friday and there might be a soccer group that's going to be using the field on Saturday so they might arrive to find wet or damp situations, which is not optimal to them. But it's critical that we take advantage of that Friday and go ahead and water. On the flip side, um, on a Thursday, the field might be dry. And you might have a PE teacher or our own soccer team who have a dry condition, and there's not much we can do about that. Um, and then it also, I, I, I put this in the literature for the board, uh, it may require us to water even on, on say, mild rainy days. If, if we don't feel like the fields are getting enough watering, and that's an email I'll often get, and you might as a board, um, where someone's frustrated because it, it may have sprinkled for a few hours and the sprinklers are still on. And that's because we still need to take advantage and get the ground the water that it needs to keep the grass alive, um, literally. Now it's timely, the report tonight, and, and I didn't know this before moving forward on this, but the California State Water Resources Control Board took action today um, to increase water restrictions, mainly with regard to um, large commercial entities, hotels, bars and restaurants, and, and furthering restrictions on them. Um, but again, that's timely because they're seeing the need and ramping up their own restrictions. 
So I spoke to that first bullet a few times already, so I won't belabor that. Um, but again, watering practices will vary from one school site to the next, depending on the water district that it finds itself, or whether it's on well water or reclaimed water. And our fields just won't be in the condition that we've all grown accustomed to. And I can assure you it's not only frustrating for our parents and our teachers and our community members, but for me and my staff and my grounds department, it's as equally frustrating because the finger's often quick to point in that direction and somehow people are remiss in their duties and where we're at right now it's really just a condition of the drought and the condition and the circumstance we find ourselves in. So with that I would be happy to answer any questions. Tonight's presentation will be followed by a resolution at the next board meeting in support of water conservation. Okay, so efforts. that's not on. Um, not on for tonight. Okay, That'll all right. be consent. Very good. All right, questions and comments from colleagues. Mr. Fortina. One question, uh, Rob. I think we all know that uh, good fields take abuse with use. Fields in poor condition take a greater abuse. Yep. Have there been discussions with respect to withdrawing facilities use agreements? I have had conversations about that with Miss um, Ballerini. I don't know if she's still be. She just joined us, but. Um, uh, Rod Edmondson as well, who oversees our facility use. We have had those conversations. Last, let me think, this fall we actually did deem a field unplayable just because of the conditions. Um, in the, we've been used to doing that because of rain. We are not used to doing that as a result of the drought. But I think the quick answer to your question is yes. We're keeping an eye on that. And in the event we feel not only, we would hope we'd never get to a point where the field is completely unplayable from a safety perspective, but I, I believe that this spring and summer we'll see that our fields are in a position that if we continue to allow outside use, then we won't be able to use them for our own athletics and for our own PE and our own um, instructional purposes, unfortunately. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Ms. Albiani. I was interested. You said Sims is on reclaimed water. What are the other two? Sims, Stone Lake and Elliot Ranch. Ranch. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Madison. Yeah, he answered the, my one question on the reclaim of schools. I was curious who was on it as well, too. Yeah, just to add a little bit uh, further on Mr. Fortina's comment, too, that I had down was the f facilities use and how some fields are so overused, particularly, I, at least in my area, with soccer on the outside folks. I mean, it just takes a, a real beating something we need to really pay attention to if we got to stop some of them or where it becomes a safety problem. And I really appreciate the board bringing that to your, to, as, as a focus for you or as, uh, an area of concern because it's, it's really hard to tell someone no. Yeah. And I can promise you, I think I know where they go when staff tells them no, and that's usually to you. So part of the reason <laughs> that we're educating you tonight is- Or social media. Th this might be, yeah, this might be something that we have to deal with in the spring and summer. Um, I hope not, but it, it very well can. And I, I don't want to belabor it or harp on it, but the amount of use our fields get, it's amazing that they're in the shape that they are in. The CSD and the local parks, they're beautiful. I'll give them that. But our fields are used all day, every single day. Right. Um, it's by our students from the minute they arrive till the minute they go home. Then the community comes on and uses them till dark, and then the community's on there Saturday and Sunday. At most of the regional parks, it's after school, right? It's when people get off work or are out of school that they're using them, and then on the weekends. Um, we're, if the sun's out, our fields are being used constantly. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be certainly nice, too, if with the various cities, or because we're a big land user, as you indicated, we want to keep up, but if we could water on a more frequent basis, but less water use instead of the runoff like you, you indicated. Yep. Uh, I think it would really uh, bow us well. I don't know if you can talk with the various. Uh, we we have asked for that and we, we continue to bring it up as a point. We can prove it, especially with our controlled systems where they're centrally controlled. Right. Um, they're set up in a fashion that, it, that we can just tell the computer reduce water consumption by 20%, 40%, whatever the number is we plug in, and it can water every other day and still reach those goals. But right now we're still being told, no, you have to do it on the, you know, the Monday and the Thursday or the Tuesday or the Friday. The fields would be in better shape. We'd actually use less water, we believe. Um, 
but I think it's a perception issue for them as much as anything. And so unfortunately the answer is still no, but we continue to press on it because again, it's, our fields are not aesthetic. They're, they're there for a specific purpose and they're needed. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Chires Espinosa. Well, it's, it's not good news, but no. thank you for letting us know what's, what's coming and for helping us, I guess, manage expectations out there. Yeah. Um, I did have one question I wanted to ask. Um, it's, it's what specifically are we bumping up against that's keeping us from being able to have this flexibility? Is it, is it law? Is it regulation? What is it exactly? Each water agency will have its own um, restrictions and there's penalties associated with violating those restrictions. So right now they're treating us just as they would um, any residents or any other user. So um, there is a state law, or no, I shouldn't say a law right now. So the governor has an executive order um, and he's requiring all water agencies to reduce water consumption by a minimum of 20 percent. The California, the California Water Resources Control Board also has a number of restrictions that it applies on the water districts. So they're saying right now you have to also reach 20 percent and have water restriction days or the user must only water twice a week. So Sacramento County Water Agency, for instance, they're allowing us to water three days a week because they have other w means and ways that they're apparently getting to the 20%. Mm -hmm. So that's allowed, but they're, most are being able to manage it themselves. Um, but it is, it, it is something that they can penalize us for. And for us, the, the penalties are steep if we violate them. There's a large um, just one-time penalty, and then there's a daily penalty associated with that as well. Right. So I want to be clear, I'm not advocating rule breaking. Yeah, no, so. we, and we don't want to do that. But <laughs> I will say they, and I don't mean to infer that they haven't been reasonable because they have. Mm -hmm. um, many of them have allowed us to water outside the allowable water hours because they understand um, the vastness of our fields and how long it takes to, to irrigate them. Mm -hmm. But um, they're still treating us within the, their framework and not allowing us any exception. Thank you. Mr. Perez, I think you had a question. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned we have two wells total or more? Uh, we have 11. 11 we wells. We have 11 sites that, that are irrigated with well water. And who monitors? So, so we have our own water quality control technicians. So if it's domestic, there's a different level. If it's just irrigation, it's another level. Uh, but we actually answer to the county um, with regard to our domestic wells. And um, do you also monitor and make sure that we don't overdraft or all the other water agencies within our aquifers do not get to that level or what? So the county, when we're irrigating with well water, is asking us to reduce by 20 percent or more. Um, but they're, we and they are constantly testing those mm -hmm. aquifers. And so th those can change at a moment's notice. Um, but right now that's what they're asking. And we have to provide them a plan of how we're achieving that. And what we're doing is just adhering to the two or three days a week, depending on what region we're in, even though technically those rules don't apply because it's, a, it's our own well and not the domestic water agency. But mm -hmm. in that case, we know we're meeting the 20% requirement. Um, do any of our schools have a water um, fire system? Oh, many of them do. They do? Absolutely, yes. Uh, how often are those checked? Oh, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's, it's, it's heavily regulated. So they're all, you're talking about fire sprinkler systems. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Many, mm -hmm. many, many of our schools have that. So they're, they're heavily regulated and they're required to be tested. And, and um, I don't know the frequency of that testing, but. Uh, yeah, that's local, a law requirement. The local fire right. district and fire marshal associated with that district checks those routinely. So who within our school district uh, gets a report? Who they report to? So the, the local fire marshal for that right. fire district, they, they come to the school sites just like they might with, with um, fire extinguishers. Mm -hmm. And so we have folks in maintenance and operations who handle that as well as um, fire sprinklers are unique because they're also part of the alarm system. So we have alarm technicians who are also associated with that as well. Well, I heard of buildings going, you know, fire, you know, max out on fires because of the fact nobody's checks on them because they don't have pressure just just similar to hydrants when fire departments go to a particular uh, communities and they don't have enough pressure and so uh, i was wondering you know how is that regulated because you know they have to flush out fire hydrants so often per year or whatever and so i was wondering right. who within our district makes 
is that? It's, it's, it falls underneath our maintenance and operations maintenance, department, okay. but also the local fire marshal. And I can assure you with schools, yeah, um, that's not one. taken lightly, and most of them are alarmed. So if the pressure falls be below a certain level, it notifies us. It was a sad day in the history of Elk Grove yeah. that we lost this new yep. historical building. Yep. All right, thank you. Very good report. Um, so, Mr. Pierce, um, I think it would be a good time for perhaps for our district to set up our two by twos with our with CCSD and with the city to discuss um, cooperative measures as well. So, so we haven't had one this year, or actually this academic year uh, starting in uh, August. So I think it would be a good idea to schedule those meetings. So whatever we need to do to put that out there, that it's uh, I think it's timely to have that discussion, and maybe that's the only thing we discuss. But I'd like to definitely see us move forward on that. Um, what are we doing to educate parents as well um, for water conservation? I think it's, you know, again, it's, this is going to require a community effort. So if yeah, you don't need to tell me so much what we are doing, but I want to make, you know, make sure that we do have those opportunities to educate parents point. on an ongoing basis yep, as well. Great point. Um, and then my last comment, you know, I, I actually read an article a few days ago. It's disturbing news saying that, you know, NASA put out a report saying that California runs out of water in a year. Uh, That's frightening. Yeah. And I just literally took a flight from Phoenix to Sacramento just prior to this uh, board meeting, and you can see it from the skies. You look at the rivers and they look like creeks. It's quite depressing. So the more, you know, the more education, more awareness, not only for us as a district, but reaching out to, uh, and educating the community vis-a-vis -vis our parents. Um, you know, it'll show that we're good stewards and are very concerned about this issue. Excellent point. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, next on the agenda, we do not have a public hearing. Uh, so we are moving on to item number 10, online board agenda. Mr. Steve Mate. Madam President. Yes, ma'am. Before we take up this item, I just want to share for the benefit of the public that I'm going to recuse myself from discussion on this item since the board may be considering um, procuring services from my employer. So I will be uh, just sitting down there until you guys are done. Thank you. <coughs> Thank Good you, evening, uh, Ms. Singh Allen, members of the board, Mr. Hoffman, Ms. Hine. I'm here tonight to talk to you about online board agendas. Um, Basically, we looked at CSB, CSBA online services, which is an agenda online. So it's a couple things going on. We have board agendas online, but the product is actually agenda online. So that's where you kind of see them jumping back and forth. Um, and basically, CSBA is an online agenda document and routing management system. Basically, it allows the automation or online use of how to create agenda items, have them routed to the correct people, have them be approved or send back for changes, and then have the agenda posted online automatically when that's all done. Um, CSBA states that you save about $460 per meeting based on just savings from all the work that comes from copying and so on. Um, again, that's coming from CSBA and that's just on the savings for the paper and the management that all goes with that. And back in August, which seems like a long time ago, we did a workshop on this product uh, to everybody here. And there's, what kind of happened was stuff happened. There's a lot of people changing of leaving, people leaving coming and so it just took a while to bring this all back. So back in August, you asked for us to kind of cost it out and figure out what it might look like. Um, some other places that are using this around the area are Folsom Cordova, Natomas, Twin Rivers, J uh, Davis Joint. So some other places are using this locally. So we went back and kind of priced it out what it might look like. To come back for our laptops would cost about $25,500. That gets us seven board member laptops, superintendent, board secretary, and then the seven cabinet members a laptop. So that's 16 devices total. We would need to replace these, and I'm just putting it out there because we got to replace these every three, four years. Their laptops, they get beat up. Four years is kind of the stretch on those things. Uh, we also would need to do some kind of modifications to the dais up there. We might need to bring in some power, bring some data around, do a little bit of tweaking up there so it sits nicely in there. We also need to have the annual CSBA Agendas Online subscription, which is $3,000 annually. And then CSBA charges $500 to do a training for the staff. So our total cost would be $31,000, which includes everything. And then ongoing would be the $3,000 for the subscription. And then three to four years laptop replacement. <coughs> Recommendation is we could just jump all in and just go right for it. But my suggestion would be that we phase this in if this is what you'd like to do. 
Um, we'd have a pilot team where we'd have two board members, the superintendent, the board secretary, and then two cabinet members be on this pilot team. We conduct meetings in a hybrid mode where they're paper and online, so it's kind of getting a combination of both. During this time, we work out the logistical, the technical, and workflow issues, because when I start to route them, how does that work? How do I see them? How do I do those things? Those things kind of need to be worked out. Um, and then I do that on a small scale before we start to go large scale. We gather all the feedback, make recommendations, tweak some things, kind of document some of those changes. And then once that's all done, then we go back and train all staff after the pilot on how to use everything. So the estimated cost for the pilot would be around $11,500. That gets you the laptops, still the modifications to the dais, and the subscription. Timeline for doing all this is depending on what happens tonight, and uh, we can order the equipment, and then in April we'll have the delivery, we'd install it all, we'd do the modification to the dais. May and June, we'd work with staff to train on how to use this and work with CSBA to conduct those trainings and then start conducting our pilot meetings. So we'd be doing, again, the hybrid mode for a couple months from May to June, gathering the feedback. Um, so then between July and August, we'd order the remaining laptops. Uh, we'd come back for discussion on that, order the remaining laptops, train everyone, and then conduct the meetings from full bore going using agenda online from CSBA. Um, those are just estimated timelines. I put down my disclaimer in there, you know, that you, no one can really read, so I keep the disclaimers nice and small, that this all is dependent on schedules, on board member schedules, CSBA schedules, delivering when actually stuff comes in, when all the modifications can happen. So I want to just put that out there. Those are just tentative timelines right now, if you decide to. Um, things for your consideration. I wanted to just throw these out there because I want you to just be thinking about some of these things. This is an online service. Connection issues can happen. It's on a server someplace else. There can be a connection from home from here where it might not work. So I have to kind of understand that might happen. Uh, business will be done differently. Um, not wrong, just different. Um, it takes a little bit of time to adjust. The way the agendas are online for our community. Right now it's a PDF. People are used to that. But you also might have to look through 150 pages to find an item. This is more of a website now when they go to it. So they can click on it and find certain items a little bit more efficiently. How that might look on a phone versus a PDF might be different. So it's just each person might be a little bit different in how they like those things. So it's a little bit of time to adjust. Also, it's more about the product. It's more about efficiency than this cost savings. The idea behind it is that you are routing documents automatically, having approvals this way. Instead of staff creating agenda items, printing them out, signing them, sending them off for approval, then making copies of those and printing them out and then having them delivered to your homes or you coming to pick them up, it's more about efficiently delivering those products than necessarily the potential of cost savings. Um, because that was CSBA's adjustments from there. When, I kinda, when we started to run some numbers, I don't know if it really panned out or not when you start to look at paper costs, but it was more about the efficiency. Um, also, some other things, if the system's updated from CSBA, uh, additional training will be needed because the way it might look, so we might have to have some more dollars for training. There had been some questions we'd heard about that they were running into some issues from CSBA, um, and it was more from the people that had been on, they transitioned to a new system. That new syst system for people that were on the old system was different. So it's a training issue. It's I'm used to this. It's the business changes of that. And so I called and talked to a few of the people that are managing that. And CSBA, they have said, has been very responsive. And they have starting to make the changes. And they hope to have the changes in a few weeks ago. But now the latest that they have, the, the changes that they've requested is April 1st. So I couldn't tell you if they are fixed for, I talked to Davis and Folsom are the two that I specifically spoke to. I can't say that they actually have been implemented because that's they're saying in April now. But it sounds like they're taking the feedback from the districts and making the adjustments based on what they're saying. So it sounds like they're very responsive. So that was my very quick presentation for you on that. So I wanted to open up for questions, discussion items. Let me know what you would like. Thank you, Mr. Mate. Uh, questions, comments from the board? Yes, Mr. Madison. Yeah, I just have, I, I know we discussed it before, CSBA is the best provider for this system and the most economical? I think that's the best is probably in how you like that. I think it, we, I looked at a couple other products. It seemed to be the best out there to manage school business. There's other ones that manage state and local businesses to do some online agendas. This one seemed very robust to me and seemed the, the price seemed very reasonable. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to trust in you that you, you did your homework on that too as well too. So, um, that's the only question I had on it. Does anyone else have questions or comments? Mr. Perez. Um, 
So what kind of laptops? Apple or Microsoft? It would be one of our, our standard ones we're starting to move toward, which is oh. this Lenovo ThinkPad. It's a yoga. So how much uh, memory or? I couldn't tell you the exact specs on it right now. It, it'll be plenty for what we're trying to do. To do Microsoft Office Suite? Absolutely. Okay. Um, um, software besides uh, uh, Microsoft? To, for online agenda, what you really need is uh, just Microsoft Word and Internet Explorer or Chrome or whatever it might be for your browser. That's what you need to do this. What if a board member requests another type of uh, software? Would, Would be that be an issue? The, well, we need to work that out, but the, we've been setting these up like we would any of our standard laptops for the district, and they're being designed and intended for the business purpose of having online agendas. Right. Um, can they handle GIS ArcView 10.3? I couldn't tell you that without knowing that specifically and having to deal with the licensing for the software and understand that I couldn't okay. speak to that right now. Um, what you said you mentioned uh, how much of the district staff would get training? Would that just be district office here in this building or throughout? Yeah, it would be basically the people that are submitting the agendas are basically the associate superintendents, um, everybody up, up here. Um, I don't know if we'd get down to all the directors or not, but it definitely would be all the staff that would be dealing directly with submitting the agenda items. Um, because I would like to make a recommendation that our calendars, Elk Grove Board of Education calendar events and the internal meeting calendars be also put on that. Is that possible? I don't know if it's a set up to be a calendaring product or not. They do allow to have agendas and set meeting dates. I don't know if it would be if it would work for that or not. We can look to see if it has that as an option. But I think right now those are being done through the Outlook calendars, correct? Um, so the meeting, the meeting invites and everything that goes into our internal systems would be very difficult to connect into that. So I'm going to. No, but I was wondering if we could just transition into the Outlook calendar instead, instead of getting these every month, two different calendars. Let me, let me I'll have to get some more information okay, on that, yeah, so okay. I can't say either way right and, now. And the other issue is that we also receive board communications uh, approximately maybe 10 to 20, 30, depends, and if we could possibly have an index of those within the server I, or whatever. I'm pretty sure that the online agenda includes BCs, but I'll go back and double check on that. Okay, and uh, also, uh, if possible, I'd like to see also um, school site committee uh, meetings as a result of the, these calendars, if we could also have a site within those um, school sites, uh, committee requests, uh, reports online, and who attended also. I'd like to see that too. This product won't be able to do that. What? That's you probably sure? exceeding what the online agenda is intended for. It's designed specifically it's to be able to manage agendas online. Right. So it's specifically just it's for board CSPA meetings. And these but things. I mean, would that have, um, what I'm requesting, a link to that, those particular areas? I think some of the hard questions drive. really, I mean, we have to get off the ground running first. Mm -hmm. And you probably don't have answers for all this, right? That's a new system. I can see you going wrong. I mean, okay. I mean you ask well, those questions. Those are some concerns. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, we got to get okay. going first on it. I think I we need to get some more specific information on exactly what you're talking about to see if that will work or not. And I think your, your, your cost with, with uh, taking to um, go paperless is much more because we have staff going about delivering our packages throughout the county. So I'm not sure if you included that in the cost. Yeah. The cost savings was a, was a research done by CSBA. That was not an internal okay, research. There's a big cost of just individuals going to our homes and delivering these packages, too, that I'm not sure if that was accounted for, and time and energy. It, it, it was in their calculations. They had a lot of things they talked about what they were doing with that, but it also depends a lot on the device because um, there's a lot of cost that obviously goes with the hardware for this, too. So, But a lot of the stuff in our packets aren't just agenda-related. There's other things that... We'll still be getting in hard copy. Um, Mr. Fortina, did you have a question or comment? Uh, just, just a couple and a comment. Yeah. First of all, thank you. I've been, I've been, a, been a advocate of online agenda systems for over two years. So, uh, and we have talked about them. It seems like for over two years. So, uh, we have we have the players in place, and we're going to move forward. Just want to uh, 
um, have a recollection of a number of items. When we had the presentation back in Walkus, I recall them saying that that those who interface with the online system, be superintendent, associate superintendent, we would have different access points or codes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Do I recall you that? You each have your own logon. So that they have their own different levels of access. All right. So that that those that are proposing agenda item would be the only people who had access to change that item. Correct. Okay. By the time you'd get the agenda items, they're basically in a read format that then you can go and take your notes on top of. Okay. And secondly, you know, as as I said a minute ago, I, I've been wed to an online system for for years. I wasn't. I'm not wed to CSBA. Um, we had a presentation by CSBA. Um, do you have an awareness of or were you requested to look into alternate systems? I don't know if I was actually asked to, but I did. Uh, we did look into other systems that I think didn't match up to this for the school board um, type level management. There were some that were much more complicated than I think we really needed to be here. Um, and I'm not trying to downplay that, it just means that they are designed for much bigger systems. Um, I think this one fit, fit everything needs, everybody's needs, and was at a lower cost. Good, okay. And because I, 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 to, me, to me, and you stated it in here, I think one of the benefits is you get, you get increased efficiency. Uh, ease of use is important, access to information is important, the transparency aspect is important. Um, and, and I think those, all of those items have to be weighed against uh, what cost might be. So uh, thank you for, for the information, Steve. Thank you. And just one thing on the efficiency, it does take, it's, it's a new system, so it does, the first time you might do it, you might not feel so efficient in it. The second time you feel a little bit more and so on. So it takes a little bit of time because it's new, so the efficiency comes in theory, but it's just a growing pain. But Yeah, yes. we're all smart. We'll get it figured out. Yeah. Ms. Thank Albiani? You. I've heard of this once. Um, so I'm feeling a little freshman right now. Um, I don't know if there's someone I could, should meet with to get a little more background or if someone could give me, just fill me in on the thought process behind this a little bit. About doing this? Mm -hmm. okay. About taking this move to spend this money to, to do yeah. this whole process. And then I have a, um, to make a decision, I think we should spend the time to find out where our true cost is and not take what they suggest. Come closer to what our true savings would be because that needs to be weighed in as a true factor. Right, and I think also what Mr. May um, mentioned in as part of his presentation is not just the cost savings, because I'm thinking it's probably cost neutral, um, more or less, I am, but it's the efficiency of it. Now, having the benefit of going through CSBA Delegate Assembly, I got to hear from colleagues throughout the region on the, the benefits of it, and some of the glitches that they experienced I did share those with Mr. Mate, and they communicated those with CSBA. So I do see them being very responsive and making sure that this, uh, it's, it's very user friendly. And so I think uh, once we go through the training, but you know, to your, to your point about uh, the costs and so on, um, you know, any, I'd be happy to meet with you or anybody else. Um, with, yeah, so I can, I, can, I can share that with you. But, uh, you know, as one board member, I'm very excited about this. I think it's, uh, you know, as the largest school district in Northern California that we're still doing it the old-fashioned way, I think it's, it's about time that we're going to be uh, using technology. Uh, so I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, thank you for the presentation, and thank you for being very responsive. This is a discussion item only, so it has not been agendized as an action item. Mr. Mates, I, I just have one question, excuse me. Yes. Uh, so, uh, LA Unified, what are they using? I mean, that's the largest in California. To be honest, I didn't look at what LA Unified was doing for this. Um, I've looked at LA Unified for other things recently, but not, <laughs> uh, not for what they were using for their online agendas. I looked locally and tried to find out what people were doing. And are they online? What's to, be, to be honest, I don't, I don't know. I, didn't, I really did not look into what LA was using. Yeah, L.A. and Orange. I'm just curious as all if you can kind of find out because they're large that we can be compared to a little bit. I mean, L.A. is much larger than us, but you have Orange down there. Are they doing business with uh, CSBA or do they have another provider? I, if you can let us know on that as a board, too. I can do that. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I can. Again, I'm just recalling from the delegate assembly meetings 
It seems that the only ones that weren't utilizing Agenda Online outside of our school district were the very small ones. Um, but it seemed, again, but again, this is all recall, so, um, yeah, so if, um, if you can, but I also want to uh, thank you for being so responsive and in, in reaching out to those school districts when I brought up those issues. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so thank you. Yes, Mr. Hoffman. So just looking for direction, um, that's one of the things that we're looking for here because we have a timeline starting in March yes. and we're in the middle of it. Um, so the idea is, do you want us to bring back a second presentation with more details addressing some of the questions that were brought tonight or do you want us to address some of those in a board communication and bring you a plan um, at a, at a, at a, for an action item to actually move forward? I think in the interest of time, if we can get it perhaps as a board communication and so that we can start phasing this in as soon as possible so that hopefully any of our questions are answered through a BC. So if you do have any outstanding questions, please share them with the superintendent. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Mate. All right. Uh, next, we have the IB Middle Years Program, and I'd like to call in Ms. Tina Penna. Thank you and good evening, President Singh Allen, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, and Ms. Hine. Uh, tonight, I have with me Mark Benson, the principal of Harriet Eddy Middle School, and Doug Craig, the principal of Laguna Creek High School. And the three of us are very pleased tonight to bring you this presentation. At the end of this presentation, we are going to ask you to approve submission of an application for candidacy for the Middle Years Program at Harriet Eddy Middle School and Laguna Creek High School. And as part of that approval, we would ask that you confirm funding for the uh, planning, implementation, and operation of this program uh, to begin at, in the timeline that we will specify. So we'll provide you with that information tonight. So our purpose is to not only tell you about the Middle Years Program, and update you about the planning that's been going on at Harriet Eddy and Laguna Creek High School, but also to review the program implementation timeline and the cost projections associated with it, and as I said, to gain approval from you to move forward with our application for candidacy. Um, we're actually going to start by talking a little bit about the diploma program at Laguna Creek High School, and from that, we'll give you details about the middle years program. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Ms. Pena. Uh, I'd also like to thank our MYP coordinators at both schools for being here tonight and all the work that they've done. It's just been crazy how busy they've been trying to get uh, people trained and uh, set for, for conferences and, and putting everything together. So I've got uh, Jose Oseguera uh, from Laguna Creek High School and Carolyn uh, Puccioni uh, from Harriet Eddy. So they're in back. Well, we first brought uh, the IB program to the district back in 2011-12, but we started at Laguna Creek with our process in 2009, and we were pretty confident because we had uh, taken a, a grant, um, that we'd gotten and received a grant to get started, and so uh, we, we brought in our first class, freshman class in 2009, and they graduated in 2013, so um, that's kind of where we started. The program is internationally recognized, that's why we wanted it. Um, it's not just benchmarked uh, in the United States, it's uh, throughout the world. Um, we, the, the class of 2015 is going to be our third um, graduating class. Uh, very, very excited to see how, how well they do. And uh, it's really important that we have the skills necessary as they come into the 11th and 12th grade um, uh, in order to be successful. Uh, we've been very successful, as we'll see here in a minute, but uh, I think it's really important we can do even better uh, if we have students that have been prepared from the seventh grade on. Uh, this becomes an, an opportunity uh, for our students in our region to, uh, to, to kind of have a, a 712 model. Um, we, we do that and we articulate 712 in a lot of ways through kind of individual math and ELA with the common core that, uh, that we've been bringing. But it's definitely, um, this, this brings in something that really helps us focus uh, even more in working with uh, Harriet Eddy as our feeder school. Uh, so we're really looking forward to it. Um, next slide. Um, 
Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Um, so we're going to have, there's two grade levels. Uh, it actually can start possibly at the sixth grade level, but we're, we're not doing that. We're starting at, at uh, Harriet Eddy, so it's going to be seven, eight. In IB terms, that's year two and three. Uh, we would continue on with year uh, four and five at Laguna Creek High School in grades nine and ten. That would lead right into our diploma program, which is grade 11 and 12. I would like to take a moment to discuss what the MYP program is, what it's made of, um, because it does prepare students for the matriculation to the diploma track, but it is important to note that it is a different program and it's treated differently by IAB. So if you note the model that's on the screen and in your handout, the center, the centerpiece or the hub is what's called the IB Learner Profile. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But as you move out, you have what's called the approaches to learning and the approaches to teaching. This is the, uh, an important concept in that IB and MYP emphasizes an conceptual and inquiry-based approach to learning. And it utilizes um, different ways for students to demonstrate understanding of the content in authentic ways. And as you go farther out on the uh, model, you'll see action and service. And part of IB and MYP is an emphasis and opportunity for students to have student action and community service within their community. This goes to the global mindset objective of the International Baccalaureate. And as you move further out, you'll have your eight areas of study or called subject groups within MYP. Students in the program will take courses in these eight areas. And in the arts, students will take courses in both performing and visual arts. The design component includes instruction on a problem solving and inquiry based um, subject. So it's a very interesting, it's design thinking class that provides students an opportunity to demonstrate understanding in a design and problem solving and critical thinking way. You have your four core, history, math, science, and English, and students are also required to take uh, a world language in each of the years of the MYP program, so students have an understanding of a variety of different cultures and develop a proficiency in a second language other than English. Part of the, inter, the MYP and the International Baccalaureate is not only students understanding the individual subject groups, but an emphasis on interdisciplinary learning. And it's an important concept within the MYP that students will be learning concepts from one subject group, but have an opportunity to learn and demonstrate what's called transferability of that concept to another subject group. So th these concepts are not lear learned in isolation in one particular content, but students are learning how that concept relates to other fields, and that provides relevancy and a deeper understanding of that concept. IB also offers external assessment and program recognition for students that complete this program. So they have systems in place for recognition for students that are able to demonstrate understanding in all eight areas. At Harriet Eddy, we would have a whole school approach. And this is an important component of MYP. It is inclusive to all students. And this includes students that are English language learners and students that have special needs. The program allows for a variety of um, levels of participation so that we have state mandates that we have um, as it relates to our students middle years program will work within those state mandates to ensure that those students are receiving that those supports but at the same time have access to the MYP curriculum and programs and supports that go with it and there's also an emphasis on that community service piece that action um, part of the MYP program so they have an opportunity to understand how they affect their community and how was to provide them with opportunities to utilize their knowledge and skills for the benefit of their community. Now this is the learner profile that I uh, mentioned earlier. This is the hub of the program. It really provides students not only with the content and conceptual knowledge, those, the knowledge to be successful in higher level classes, but also provides the attitude and skills and knowledge to be successful in higher level classes, post-secondary education, and in the workplace. So the unit plans and the lessons and the activities provide understanding of the concepts, but also build these characteristics that are 
same within the IB. Students that are inquirers, thinkers, excellent communicators, risk takers, so that we prepare students who are knowledgeable, that are principled yet open-minded, caring, balanced, and reflective. It's important to note that MYP is a holistic approach to learning. It addresses the intellectual and academic needs of our students, the uh, math, arithmetic, and writing, but also addresses the social, emotional, and physical well-being of students. So it's that holistic approach to learning. There is a variety of research out there, a significant amount that supports not only the benefit for IB, but also the middle years program. And there was a study done that uh, analyzed results from MYP and non-MYP students. These are middle schoolers. And they showed, an MYP students showed an increase in proficiency and advance rate in mathematics and sciences. Point two and three specifically reference our strategic goal of student wellness that holistic approach that I mentioned before, that students demonstrated or they talked about a connectedness to school, that they're there for academics, but the, the focus and collective attitude that MYP provides a school, students were connected to the school in a more meaningful way and increased their positive outlook at the school. And point four, students that were in MYP and matriculated from it had an increased participation in higher level high school courses, which shows the, uh, what talks to the strategic goal number one of high quality classroom instruction. But those four points are the benefits for our students, which are a major stakeholder. But MYP also provides benefits for another major stakeholder, our educators, our teachers. And a study demonstrated that Teachers saw the MYP program and the professional development as meaningful to our teachers and improved instruction. Again, going back to our strategic goal number one, high quality classroom instruction. And research shows, and, it's, um, and so far we've um, seen some of that with uh, students that have graduated from Laguna Beach High School, um, that there's increased uh, post-secondary school enro enrollment when compared to non-IB kids. Um, also, a greater acceptance rate in, into many colleges. Um, there's a greater persistence rate. Uh, it's a pretty crazy. 98% first-year college retention rate, um, which is way higher than uh, that 95% or 75% average. Um, and even further, as you go, because students are largely they're getting credits already to get them kind of a jump start um, in college. Um, they're also doing so much college-level work that they're able to just step right in and um, be able to, to, be, to perform at a, at a high level. Um, personal experience uh, with my daughter. She graduated last year, and she's in college right now. And her, she got the first um, semester credit in English. Mm -hmm. Now the second semester, it's everything she did in her IB class. Um, so she's sitting back thinking she's all that. Um, <laughs> I said, no, hold on, honey. <laughs> you, you need to, to wait for those higher level courses. But it, it really does. It, it allows for that retention because they're ready and prepared for college because they've been through every aspect of what they're going to be expected to do in college. Um, the increased de degree completion. I mean, 74% of diploma program graduates earn a degree in four years. That's, that's a great statistic. Um, Moving on, as far as the success that we've seen at our program, um, the first two graduating classes, you can see that uh, diploma candidates, we actually had uh, 41 students who tried and, and attempted to do it all, everything that, um, that, that they had to do, all six courses, uh, plus the theory of knowledge, plus the S college essay, um, and their c uh, community action and service. And so um, they, they, they went for it all, not just part of it, and 61% of those made it the first year. Um, they got that diploma, passed it at the high enough level. 81.2% uh, of our kids, all kids taking whatever, if it's one course or two or three or whatever, passed uh, at, with a score of four or higher um, on their, on their uh, exams. Uh, last year, we jumped up to 79% of our students uh, passed and, and attempted the full diploma, um, and 81.8%. As far as how does that compare in the nation, um, nationally, 69% passed all their exams, so we're 12% over that, and in the state of California, 66% last year actually passed. Mm -hmm. Now, I briefly touched on the 
enrollment criteria and the selection. It is a whole school model, so there will be no prerequisites, which will provide opportunity for all students to participate in various levels and addresses the individual students that have uh, need to require supports or s students with special needs and IEPs. Um, in order to uh, complete the program, students will need to demonstrate understanding in all eight areas of the subject groups and complete uh, two projects. The first project is a community or group project that is in the eighth grade or year three, and a second project, which is a personal project, which is in, in year 10. And M Mr. Craig talked about the excellent results at Laguna Creek. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this MYP program will provide students with those necessary skills to make that program even better than it already is. Um, I know that our district provides excellent education to all students, um, like Superintendent Hoffman. I'm also a product of the Elk Grove District, so I could tell you firsthand uh, the excellent education that we receive here. But the MYP definitely provides students with a conceptual approach that uh, provides students an opportunity, especially when we talk about post-secondary ed and uh, going into college and in the workplace. And there's also instructional benefits um, as it relates to MYP. MYP is an instructional methodology, it's a structure. It aligns with our Common Core and our state mandated testing already. It provides opportunity for students to learn the 21st century and critical thinking skills that are important um, to our students as we move forward in developing their skills to be uh, successful in higher ed and in the workplace. And the interdisciplinary piece um, really should be emphasized because the conceptual approach to learning and allowing students to have authentic assessments that ask students to demonstrate understanding that directly relates to their learning really provides the depth of understanding for our students. It provides opportunity for our students to work within the department and for our staff to have horizontal and vertical collaboration among the different sites. So it provides that opportunity for our staff. Which goes right into my next slide. Mm -hmm. um, fast there we go so it's it, like we talked about it strengthens the articulation between our schools um, as it aligns with uh, with the students as they matriculate from Eddie to Laguna Creek High School um, I think it's going to if we've got all the students who are experiencing the uh, the middle years program we're gonna have with our with the whole OCR concern about having uh, all of our students represented in honors and uh, IB AP classes, um, this is going to be a great opportunity for the kids in our region mm -hmm. in matriculating through to us because they're going to know coming out of middle school exactly what they need to do mm -hmm. and to be successful. And so we're going to get, we're going to see a huge growth in the number of students taking our, um, our IB classes. Um, it also opens up the possibility of establishing a, a, a primary years program within our region, whatever that might look like. Benefits to the district, um, offering an internationally benchmarked high quality learning uh, attracts and retains students to Laguna Creek High School region, both within and outside the district. Um, we have great stories of, of that happening. We've uh, had students that were um, going to Mira Loma their freshman year, have come back to Elk Grove uh, because we've had the program. We've had, um, we, we've created a really nice partnership um, with some of the Montessori schools in our region um, because it fits really nicely with the Montessori program. And uh, so it's, it's, we're bringing students that are either traditionally private or um, going other places to come back into the district. So it gives us that uh, advantage to, to maintain uh, the enrollment. And a lot of that has to do with because that, that commonality of that learner profile, they get all the way in seven through 12. So it's a great opportunity for our kids in our district. Mm -hmm. Now, where are we? Uh, the 14-15 school year was the consideration phase. We conducted a feasibility study, um, sent traf staff to training to get an idea of what the MIP was about, and began developing some curriculum and focusing on the, the application for candidacy process. 
in the next year upon uh, approval for candidacy will continue the staff training to ensure that staff are trained and have the time they need to develop the unit plans and artifacts necessary for authorization, but we'll also begin to integrate the MYP courses into um, our offering next year. Part of uh, what MYP allows is for teachers to get training, but also refine their craft using the conceptual and inquiry approach to learning so that they refine it so it is um, done with fidelity and high quality. So that will be during the 15-16 school year. That will also allow us to, during the 16-17 school year, upon application for authorization, that IB will make a site visit, they'll talk to our teachers, they'll talk to our staff, and they'll look at artifacts to ensure that the MYP program is being implemented with fidelity and high quality to their standards. Additionally, we'll begin the articulation for our students that are matriculating from year 10 MYP on what that will look like for them going into the diploma program as juniors. So as Mr. Craig talked about earlier, that 7-12 continuum of, of learning um, will begin to be developed. And then after the authorization visit and receiving word from IB of our acceptance, 1718 will be the first full year and our first cohort of uh, MYP students during authorization. So how do we pay for all of this? Um, this year, we have utilized multiple funding sources. Uh, we did use uh, from local control funding formula. We use the designation for the gate honors and advanced placement IB. Uh, that was supplemented by site supplemental funds, which each of these schools received, as well as by federal Title II dollars, which, was de which were designated for professional development. Now, I know that there is a concern about taking away from um, existing funding and there there should be no concern because one of the things that uh, we are going to do is to provide a separate recommendation through the district's LCAP plan uh, to fund the middle years program on an annual basis so it will no longer come from that gate honors AP designation which was the five hundred thousand dollars that the board approved last year to support our expansion of gate and honors and advanced placement so we are recommending a separate funding structure through LCFF um, the next two slides and I don't expect you to see them but I wanted you to see the amount of planning that's gone into this you can see that for the next four years we have broken out the phase of application uh, Mark just explained that this year we have our request for candidacy with the application for candidacy due by April 1st um, next year we are able to begin integrating the curriculum uh, we also and I think Mark said this uh, would be assigned an IB appointed consultant and that is a critical critical step because that person guides us and helps us to ensure that the program that we're putting together not only meets IB standards but also um, meets the expectations that we have in our district. Uh, we would be submitting new course approvals in our district by April 1st. The following year, uh, which is the candidate phase also, the verification visit, uh, we have the actual application for authorization due early that year on October 1st and should that be successful then we would see full implementation in 1718 but like Laguna Creek we can begin actually employing the curriculum and the changes in instructional practice next year with the assignment of the consultant. So tonight, well actually no, not tonight, we've got more here. So actually I, we have a cost and, and a projected cost and funding sources for uh, not only this year, but subsequent years and, and again, uh, there would be the separate uh, LCAP recommendation that we fund on as, as a separate align item, the middle years program. You can see that this year uh, we spent approximately $41,500 from the three sources identified there. We anticipate for the next two years we'll be looking at about $52,000 and then once the program is implemented um, about $35,000, $36,000 a year and that would be split between the two sites. For next year there there may have to be uh, some augmentation of staffing as we ensure that we have the balance of teacher credentialing with the courses that we need to um, 
provide. So for example, one of the recommendations, actually one of the requirements of the middle years program is that there be uh, language instruction for every student every year. And at this point, we don't have the world language department at Harriet Eddy Middle School, so we would need to bring that in and ensure that we do have appropriate credentialing for everything that you saw in those required areas. And so that is an adjustment process and a refinement process that would be able to take care of. So at this point, um, we are happy to answer questions, and then we would ask that you approve the submission of the middle years program application for candidacy, and as part of that approval, you would confirm funding for our continued planning, for the program implementation, and for ongoing operation. So we'd be happy to entertain questions at this time. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, questions, comments from my colleagues? Yes, Ms. Chaires Espinosa. Hi there, great presentation and appreciated the background materials as well. Um, I'm having trouble understanding two areas, so I want you to explain to me what is the benefit of um, phasing in 7th and 8th grade and leaving a gap as opposed to creating 9th and 10th grade and that continuity with the existing 11th, 12th grade programs you have now? We're not phasing it in. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, speak. It's continuous. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, um, my answer here, but when it comes to the MYP, the MYP is a five-year program right. that starts typically with sixth grade right. through tenth grade. Right. So when the MYP program at, at Hedy, Eddy and Laguna would have that four years um, with students at seven, eight, Harry Eddy, and then going to nine and ten, yeah. and then they would matriculate into the diploma track program if they I, chose to. Yeah. Right. I, I guess I'm wondering um, why we would leave that kind of lack of continuity, whether that might have any negative impact on the students when they would be in an IB program for two years, go outside of IB for two years, or is that not the way it would it work? Would, no, no. Wonderful, I'm glad I asked. It would be consistent. <laughs> it, would, it would be consistent. The students would be in the, um, the, when we talk about IB, you're talking about diploma track, I'm talking about the transition phase, when you phase it in. So would there be no lack of? of no, there's no, okay. there's no phase in. Okay. Upon 17, 18 on authorization, yeah. se students in 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th okay. will be part of the program. To be part of the program, right. you need not go through all four years. Right. So students that are at Laguna Creek as freshmen and sophomore during the 17, 18 school year will be part of the program, taking courses okay. in the MYP, and then going into the diploma program, so there won't be a phasing. All right, apparently I misread the phasing, my apologies. I did have one more question, Madam yes, President. Absolutely. Um, I want to make sure I understand what you mean by the whole school approach. So I understand you don't have to be a, a diploma candidate per se to take the classes. That's my understanding. Um, so can any student take IB classes once they're at, at a school that has an IB program? At the middle school, all students will ha will be taking MYP classes, mm -hmm. so they would have opportunity to enroll in those MYP classes based on the varying level of needs of students. So, if students have uh, an IEP that requires certain supports in certain classes that may not necessarily be MYP aligned, they'll be able to have those supports. Yet, potential, like for example, take an MYP history, an MYP art, but maybe have uh, a support class in. English. Mm -hmm. So at the middle school in years uh, grades seven and eight, years two and three, all students will have an opportunity to take those classes at varying levels depending on their needs. Okay. But at the 11th and 12th grade level, um, it is yes, they can either be the whole uh, diplo full diploma candidate or they can take one class or two or three. So it's up to the students at that point. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank and you, I, great question. That's the way we also would plan for the ninth and 10th grade, is yep. that um, they wouldn't have to necessarily go into an MYP classes, um, so it's not an all-school approach. You know, we feel that we have the, the academies and the other things that students might choose to do as well, so, right. um, so at the high school, we wouldn't do that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ms. martinez -Aleri. Um I just had a question, a great presentation, and thank you for giving that information, very informative. Um, I just had a question is regarding the outcomes. Once the student completes, is there any direct linkage or data to collect for the student enrollment in college after they complete the IB program here within the district? 
Um, yeah, within the district, at this point, no, we only have two classes. Um, so once we, you know, once we get out there and we look at the data that we share, we talk about, you know, college completion. Well, they're just now uh, juniors, so we'll, we'll get that data within the next four or five years when the UCs give that back. Okay. We are getting information um, regarding the, uh, the persistence um, for, for that first class, I believe, as they go from their freshman year persisting into their sophomore year. So we will get that kind of data as we go over the next few years. Also, it'd also be nice to see um, possibly how you mentioned your daughter went through the program to have those students come back as mentors also or speak at least to the next group going through. Um, and then two other points I just wanted to make. I'm excited to see um, the correlation between retention rates for students when they are enrolled in the UC system or CSU system, but also I find it um, very critical because these touch base on the eight subject areas. And as far as that I see within the UC system, a lot of students now are choosing to double major and so it's, it's nice to see this um, element in, imposed in the program because again they're going to be um, have access to all these other content areas which are really instrumental and again the completion rates um, when they do transfer to four year they're looking not just for them to complete within four years now they're on a fast track to have students to complete in three years and so that's something just down the road through the pipeline that you know may need to be factored in and again that exposure early on is really critical for the students. Thank you. Any, Mr. Porcina? Thank you. I am 100% excited. Um, I, I think having the NYP program is, is going to do so many things. It's certainly going to improve our open enrollment numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it provides uh, opportunities for kids to be connected with school. I think and I really believe from what we've seen already that NYP will uh, work to uh, uh, reduce achievement, so-called achievement gap. Uh, I, one of the biggest problems with achievement gap is kids don't go to school. If you're not in school, you can't learn. Um, and this is a kind of program that will certainly hook them. Uh, for the benefit of, of, of really um, public more than anything else, I had several questions about uh, the program. And Mr. Hoffman and Ms. Pena have both been very gracious in an answering those questions. Spe my specific questions dealt with, one, uh, what appeared to me to be uh, the reduction of gate funds as a, as, a, as a way to fund this. And we worked so hard last year to give uh, a minimal bump to gate. I, I just couldn't see how we would take away from something we, we, we did. And uh, I'm, I am very satisfied, number one, that uh, the, the gate won't be impacted. And number two, I, mean, I think it's really important. This is an, an initiative to, to meet a number of objectives. The money on the table is nothing. I mean, it's absolutely nothing. Uh, when we look at the, not only the size of the budget, but when we look at the size of our reserves, probably a lot of money compared to the supplemental budgets that our principals get. Um, but uh, uh, it's we'll take doubling that nothing, yeah, and 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 I, and I would quadruple it for you if I could. Um, but it's a minimal amount of money, and so when we look at the objectives, uh, uh, I think I think uh, there will be support across the board. The other question I had, and I know you're working on it, was what what will we do to bring the message to the elementary schools? Uh, once again, if, we're, if we're, we're looking at not only offering an opportunity, we're also looking at having a positive impact on our open enrollment numbers. So we want retention at Eddy, we want retention and enrollment at Laguna. And, and that was my second question, is uh, what, what are we going to do in the way of a PR program into the middle schools? So, Timely question. Actually, um, first of all, Mr. Benson has already spoken with the uh, seventh grade parents and just talked about this conceptually. And there was great excitement, and obviously those parents represented each of the feeder schools, and so there is information um, about the potential for the program. Also, uh, Ms. Pinkerton and I uh, will be working uh, on the beginnings of a marketing campaign, and, and I don't want to get too off track, but one of the things that we're also doing, we'll be doing focus meetings, not only with the principals of those schools um, that lost uh, enrollment through open enrollment, um, but with the 
communities, you know, to say what would it have taken for you to have remained here. So that work is in progress. Yeah. And then just by way of last comment, you know, I've had an opportunity to talk to a number of parents already, and the anticipation is so great in terms of the program coming. Uh, they understand the benefits. They, they want the articulation between the middle and the high school. Uh, the support's out there for this. Thank you. Mr. Perez, I believe you had a question or comment. Yes. Um, I support this program 100%. I've seen it um, implemented in other uh, school districts throughout the United States. And um, it does get students involved. They know the meaning of theory and practice and put it together. And um, the issue I have is that I thought I heard you say that you have not completed your LCAP yet or you need to amend it or what? The, 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 as we're gathering input right now, one of the recommendations that I have placed onto the LCAP for consideration is a separate line item for funding for the middle years program as opposed to taking it out of the existing ongoing funding for GATE honors and advanced placement. So originally we had it embedded in there, but I think it's important enough to highlight on its own. So what the board will receive when they receive the staff's recommendations for funding as one item will be a separate item for the funding of the middle years program. So how much of the LCAP plan, do you have an LCAP plan for this also? It would be included within the two schools LCAPs. In terms of the you districts, in terms of the districts, it's one item among many that will be coming forward. We're in the consultation phase right now, gathering input from our various stakeholders. And one group of stakeholders is, is the, the cabinet and the pre-K-12. And so this is one item that I've brought up from my division. Well, that's the issue I have. The LCAP hasn't finished, and I think it should be finished before we approve this. Uh, if the stakeholders haven't approved it, as you say, mentioned that they're at the table, so. The funding for this year was paid for out of existing funds. And I specified the funds that, that we used. We used the honors gate and AP. We used site supplemental funds. And we used Title II, which is professional development. If need, that money is ongoing. I know there's an interest in not, in not um, eating away at that money, which was why an additional item is being brought forward. But if need be, for the amount of money that we're looking at for next year, which is less than $52,000, we could continue to take it out of that $500,000. Okay, it's just the process. Um, the other question I had, you mentioned on page um, five, that's 74 of the of um, programs graduates. I imagine those aren't those are nationwide of, of the program, not Laguna. Is that correct? Yes. And do you plan to get data sets or for that successful program that you're implementing right now? Like very similar to uh, my colleague here. Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. So, I think that's very important yeah, absolutely. outcomes. Because um, like I said earlier this evening, we need outcome data. Uh, we're gonna spend the LCAP monies, new regulations state that. Um, open enrollment issues. Now you plan to market this at other where? How do you plan to do that? I think the marketing campaign would be district-wide, but would also extend beyond the district. Honestly, um, when we opened the diploma program at Laguna Creek, we did attract uh, new students from other districts, and we're certainly happy to welcome them to our district and to <laughs> our programs. Okay. Uh, I have a suggestion. Uh, I think it was on add foster youth to one of those uh, targeted areas. If we're going to use LCAP, we should include foster youth on page three, I think that was. Thank you. Um, oh, yes, a uh, whole school approach is inclusive of all students, including English language and students with special needs. I would suggest that you include foster youth and socioeconomic thank students. You. Okay, thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. I, I'm assuming you probably meant that when it says inclusive of all students, all students. and you just gave but two clear, examples. It should be yeah, inclusive because again, we need. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Are you done, Mr. Press? Okay. How many graduates per um, session do you have? Do graduating classes like your daughter went through? Um, last year we had, it was, it was our smallest class, we had 330. 330? 330. Oh, approximately how many graduates? That, that's how many graduated. I mean, it, well, we had 330. Of, how we had of seniors? We had 95, 96% graduation. No, no, but there's 330 of the graduating senior class? Uh -huh. Of how many? So I'm saying. you had a high school graduation class of three. 330 yes. seniors that graduated, yes. and they were all participating in this program? No, no. We had, um, there were 140 to 150 students that took one or more IB classes, and if you look on no. uh, page five, uh -huh. um, for last year, we had uh, 329 tests taken. Mm -hmm. uh, there were 39 actual diploma kids who took all of those okay. courses. Okay. And 31 of those students passed all their exams. Okay, thank you. Very good. Mr. Madison. Yeah, I don't have any questions. A really fantastic report. Uh, I'm just excited about it. Uh, I'll echo Mr. Forcina. It, the, this, the dollars is nothing on this in, in terms of educating kids and having something innovative in our district like this. So I, I, I want to move on it. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Alviani. I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading about this ahead of time and hearing your presentation. I think the opportunities we give in our district are outstanding, and this is just another opportunity for those yeah. children that are interested. So I appreciate your hard work. I also believe it's very inspiring to teachers. I think it's a great way to let teachers grow mm -hmm. and just become better educators, and it's a win-win. So go team. You know, as a board member who represents a good portion of the Laguna region, I'm very excited for us. Uh, this is what I've been waiting for since I've joined the board, is to see a wonderful program expand and thrive and, and, uh, and adding it uh, to Harriet Eddy. Um, long discussions with the former principal, Mr. Del Bonta, about this as well over the course of the year. So I'm very excited and proud. I uh, just can't wait to see how this grows over the years and being a role model for other districts as well. So kudos to all of you on working so diligently on this. And, you know, I think Mr. Forcina and Mr. Madison and Ms. Albiani and really the board has raised some excellent, um, some excellent points. What this is going to mean for, for enrollment is going to be fantastic. I can't wait to see what, what the numbers will be once we have this fully implemented. I imagine we'll, we'll, we will see a great dramatic turnaround and really marketing this as a destination place where you want to be. So kudos to all of you. Um, with that, I'd like to call for a motion to approve the submission of an application for candidacy to include the IB Middle Years Program in grades 7 through 10 at Harriet Eddy Middle School and Laguna Creek High School. Make a roll call. Roll, I think he please. moved it already. Didn't Mr. Madison move it? Pardon? Didn't Mr. Madison I, move sorry, it already? Yeah. Okay, I, we I have would a move request <laughs> for a roll call vote, but I do have a motion. And do I have a second? I have a second here from Mr. Forcina. Ms. Hine, would you do a roll call, please? Aye. 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 Another component, parent engagement component, and I'm willing to give you money for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And as a reminder, no board can allocate by themselves. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, next item, item number 12, tentative agreement between Elk Grove Unified School District and Elk Grove Education Association. Dr. Kruger. Good evening, President Sing Allen, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, Ms. Hine. Uh, I bring to you this, uh, this evening uh, a request that uh, you approve the tentative agreement between the Elk Grove Unified School District and the Elk Grove Education Association for 2014-2015 and 2015-2016, which is dated February 25th, 2015. 
First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the bargaining team members from EGEA and our management team from EGUSD um, in the kind of collaboration and interest-based uh, bargaining process that we used uh, to come up with this agreement. Uh, as there has been affirmative action by EGEA to ratify the tentative agreement that happened on uh, the 10th of March, um, and uh, the AB 1200 re review has been approved by the Sacramento County Office of Education, the EGUSD board president should announce and open a public hearing with a request for anyone who wishes to speak to the proposal to please come forward. After listening to any speakers, the board president should close the public hearing. After closing the public hearing, the board should be asked to take action to approve or ratify the tentative agreement. All right, well, I will take the first item, and that is to call for a public hearing. Hearing no speakers, and I will close the public hearing and open it up for questions and comments from the board. Mr. Fortina. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sing Allen. Um, I have a number of, of comments I, I would like to make and, and indicate certainly that I, I stand in support of this tentative agreement. First of all, I want to say thank you, EGA. EGA has consistently been fiscally conservative and responsible in its requests uh, for improvement in contract. And that has been a standard of your behavior, and I think it should be recognized. Secondly, I, I, I can't say how much I'm excited about the fact that we will finally have uh, the opportunity to have a comparability study. It's something that is long overdue. Uh, many of us have wanted it. Having a comparability study will take the issue of compensation uh, out of speculation. It will give us data to look at where we are, and it will pro provide the opportunity for us to make a decision about where we want to go and how we want to get there. Uh, third, I thank EGA again and our district leadership and the board for the wisdom in seeing the benefits of a multi-year agreement. Multi-year agreements provide stability and they allow us to address substantive issues without the pressure of having to, to, to meet a deadline. Uh, sometimes we're in a position where uh, we have to have the right people before change can occur. I believe today we have the right people. I believe that this tentative agreement is going to uh, guide our tomorrow, and I see our tomorrows being very bright, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Forcina. I believe Ms. Chaitis Espinosa had a comment or a question. Yes, just very briefly in line with what we just heard. I want to thank uh, everyone involved in crafting this agreement, both on the side of, of EGA but also our own staff. Um, I think it's a it's a great beginning as we you know move on to work on with the work with some other bargaining units and their unique needs and uh, understanding that you know we're all different but I think the tone that has been set is is great and very conducive to um, to the work that lies ahead um, I, I want to congratulate you all for your your respective piece the credit that you deserve for that climate of, of respect um, and I also want to say that I I think it's in the best interest interest of everyone to have a multi-year agreement so I'm just I'm very proud of all of you so congratulations on your work Mr. Madison. Yeah, I just want to add, too, I'm very, very pleased, uh, our leadership and the EGA's leadership. It just shows you the interest-based bargaining does work, the collaboration. And most of all that I was really impressed with, we had kids involved when we were going through this process. And to me, that that's just kudos when you can look at how effective we're going to educate our kids through our bargaining process as well. It's going to benefit both parties. So again, I really appreciate all the hard work, your staff and superintendent and and Maggie, the leadership and the bargaining at EGEA. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Albiani. This was my first time and it has been so positive and just how I would hope it is always. <laughs> That's right. No, I, it is just fabulous. It has been a, incredibly positive. What we have been reported back to by the people that were helping represent us, it was nothing but positive interest-based 
is a 100% positive way to go about things. I think multi-year is in the beneficial of everyone to be able to make solid plans. And I do believe we did not lose sight that it is for the children and how we can do the best for the children. And so I really appreciate everybody's hard work and willingness to listen to each other and work together. Thank you. And I don't have any necessarily additional comments. I think uh, Mr. Fortuna did an excellent job uh, summarizing all of the fine points. I just huge congratulations to all parties involved. Um, tremendous, tremendous work. And again, I think we are leading the way for other school districts right here as we speak. So thank you for everything. Um, at this point, I would, no, oh, who, Mr. Perez? For myself, I'd just like to echo my colleagues up here. I think everybody stated, um, you know, again, the recognition of all the individuals and staff members and employees um, coming together in this collaboration. And I'm looking forward um, to having many more experiences, <laughs> positive experiences with negotiations in the upcoming months and down the road in the years <laughs> to come. Yes, I'd like to echo uh, what my fellow uh, board members have said. Bottom line is for our students. I'd like to thank EGA and staff, and especially our legal component, who is very knowledgeable on the interest-based uh, bargaining. And we were promised to get in-service training, and hopefully we do we get that. But the whole process was, was that, and it was a good reflection. Um, it's getting better. <laughs> These two-year, uh, multi-year uh, contracts, I believe in them. We could do a lot more for, and planning ahead of time versus after the fact. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, I would like to call for a motion to approve the tentative agreement. Okay. I'll move it. I'll second. We have a motion and a second, Ms. Chaitis Espinosa. Uh, let's do a roll call vote for this, please. I'll be on Aye. Madison. Aye. 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 Perez. Yes. Aye. Aye. Thank you and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, next item number 13, National Nutrition Month Resolution, Ms. Michelle Drake. <laughs> Good evening, President Singh Allen, Board Member Superintendent Hoffman, and Ms. Hine. I'm here this evening to request the Board recognize March as National Nutrition Month. National Nutrition Month is a campaign sponsored by the Academy of Nutrition's, Nutrition and Dietetics that um, focuses on eating healthy, being physically active for students. Um, food and Nutrition Services, that's a focus for us, and um, every March we support or focus on um, Harvest of the Month by doing a poster contest throughout the K-6. Um, and if you've been on the board for a while, you've seen our poster, um, our calendars that come up with student artwork based on fruits and vegetables and the importance in co of consumption of fruit, plenty of fruits and vegetables. So if you have any questions. I don't have any questions. I'll move it. All right. Uh, I <laughs> Mr. As a full employee of the WIC program, I support this 100%. Um, but I would like to also um, our staff to give some guidance or possibly go and do some, uh, establish some farmer markets within our school sites. Uh, like for instance, uh, Florin High School, Rudder, and that geographical area. Do we have food deserts within our, our districts? And as a researcher, I know they exist, especially in that underserved area. And so, that's what I would suggest that one of the goals that we ought to do is you uh, and we provide farmers markets at, at special events. We right. um, work with administrators and staff on campuses to do special events. But if it's not to a student, if it's more marketed to families, right. it has to be a non program fund. Um, right. And so we do do that on some scale. Right. Um, we have done them at schools throughout the district and continue to do so. Right. But on a year round basis, like maybe possibly every Sunday at particular schools. It's not something that the Food Nutrition Services Department can fund. It is not a cafeteria fund um, item, you. but as a district, if that is something that's important to the board, um, Those, and you would like to. So I would <laughs> urge you, Mr. Perez, to bring that up in your meeting. Yeah, I know. With, we can uh, do it. <laughs> have that in your meeting with our superintendent. Yeah, I'd like okay, to call yes. for a motion to adopt Resolution 51, 2014-15, designated the month of March as National Nutrition Month. So moved. So moved. Mr. Madison. Oh. 
You moved it and we had a second. All right, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. <laughs> we could aye. do aye. it. Thank you. Thank we you. could do it. <laughs> all right, next up, Mr. Cerruti for Public Schools Month Resolution. Thank you, President Singal and members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Hine. During the 1920s, the free and accepted Masons of California initiated the annual recognition of the role that public schools play in our communities. And since then, the state of California has designated April as Public Schools Month. The purpose of Public Schools Month is to encourage communities to set aside time to honor our public schools and to enlist the community's continued support for public education. And with that, I respectfully request that the board consider the resolution that proclaims April 2015 as Public Schools Month in the Elk Grove Unified School District. Thank you, Mr. Ceruti. I'd like to call for a motion to adopt resolution number 52, 2014-15, proclaiming April 2015 as Public School Month in the district. So moved. We second. have a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Kruger, next, uh, resolution to eliminate or reduce classified positions. No problem. <laughs> hey. Good evening once again. President Singh Allen, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, Ms. Hine. Um, I bring to you at this moment a resolution to eliminate or reduce classified positions. I'd like to explain that a little bit further before you take action to approve. Um, the positions that you have before you are as a result of funding that has not yet been verified um, to move forward for next year. Um, as you notice on the uh, attachments to the resolution, um, we have uh, uh, two uh, positions that are within the CSEA unit um, that are funded by a particular uh, grant that is still in the process of being approved, as well as we have a, a number, a s small number compared to um, past years uh, we have uh, 12 AFSCME positions that are on this that we're still waiting for um, funding verification for PTA or PTO funding sources as well as a, a couple of school readiness grants. So we are working very closely with our site principals, with our uh, cabinet members um, uh, associated with these programs as well as with our uh, fiscal department. And as soon as we get verification of funding, um, we can start taking these names off. So when you do approve this, it's because this is the current information that we do have and we do need the approval to move forward with the notification that goes forward with these but we are working diligently to make sure we get the funding verification information um, still so that we can eliminate the action involved with uh, the approval of uh, providing notice with, uh, prior to si 60 days prior to uh, a layoff and I might add that um, last year uh, when this item came forward um, we did get verification of funding for uh, all of the items based on the records that I've reviewed, mm -hmm. and so the, it, it was very positive. It's just we have to take this action at this time. Okay. Thank you for the um, update and additional information, Dr. Kruger. Any questions or comments from the board? Yes, Mr. Perez. Is this like a pink um, list process or what? Uh, it is a, it's a, the approval process gives us the authorization to issue notice uh, to classified employees on this list who serve in these positions. Um, it is quite a, a process, but uh, as I said, we are um, looking to verify the funding uh, for these positions that just has not been uh, verified yet. Anybody and else? What's our, what's our source of funding? You mentioned we have a process of what, what type of grant? So we have listed on the attachments, for example, um, I'm, I'm going to look at uh, resolution number 53, um, item one is a library technician. Uh, that is funded by the PTA, PTO. So it's in the third line under each item. And so we're looking, at, we're just looking to get verification from the PTA, PTO at that particular school. 
so that we can continue with that position. Okay. It's all provided okay. in the attachments. All right, I would like to call for a motion to adopt resolution number 53 and 55, 2014-15, eliminating classified positions. I'll move it. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Um, roll call, please. Aye. 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 Thank you, Dr. Kruger. Thank you. All right, next we have board member and superintendent reports. Any board members have a report to submit? No. Mr. Fortina. Two, quickly. Uh, one, uh, had a very successful meeting uh, again with the uh, Sheldon FFA Advisory Committee. And I understand that one of my colleagues has made a recommendation that I be on another committee at another FFA school. Yes. yes. <laughs> I was talking to Mike last week. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, one of the things that, that we agreed to, and, and I really thought it would be very, very positive, FFA comes before the board for recognition activities like so many of our programs do, and yet we, it's, it's rare that we have uh, information really provided with respect to all the benefits of FFA, uh, what, it, what is available to students, what it means for their future, what leadership opportunities are provided, and uh, a recommendation was made that the FFA teachers make a request to be on agenda. And so I would think that that would be coming forward uh, sometime soon. So that was positive. The other thing which, which uh, I've mentioned before, and I'm just really excited, we had uh, meeting number four, three, four of the SARB committee. And we are very, very close now uh, to having a model uh, for our, our student attendance review board uh, a model that will look at uh, and define purpose and process and personnel and, and, and really uh, signify that we as a group see it as an intervention model. Uh, its purpose is to provide support to families and children so they can have uh, uh, whatever needs are, are blocking uh, their children from attending a school removed uh, so that we have that opportunity to, to provide uh, education to children. So that's coming down the pike and uh, really excited about that. Okay. Are you going to ask for, uh, for more funding possibly? This is just a report, Mr. Perez. <laughs> yes. Mr. Madison. Yeah, I just want to mention that we had a dinner meeting with the County Board of Education, mm -hmm. and Deb, Deb Sign put on a very good presentation about the Common Core. Uh, she was probably known to most of you. She was uh, Deputy Superintendent of the state, and it was a wonderful pr presentation for a lot of the districts uh, in our region around. I thought it was very formative. Um, board member Bobby Singh Allen, our president, was there, and Nancy Shear, she was there as well, too, all three of us. So it was very informative. And our superintendent, you were there. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Just wanted to bring that up to you. Thank you. Um, real quickly, yes, I, I also obviously attended the dinner. Um, Mr. Forchina and I attended the middle school leadership conference. And again, just bold, courageous discussions, just such a dynamic group. Uh, I attended two of the workshops uh, later part in the, in the afternoon. And it is just one of the best things I think that we do in our district. So c kudos to everybody that helps organize that. It's just tremendous work. I attended briefly, and I say briefly, the CSBA Lobby Day. Uh, my son got sick ha halfway through the day and got the calls that I had to leave. You were there too. Did you see me? Okay, I was there, but like I said, briefly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of fellow board members from throughout, the uh, throughout California were in attendance. And as I recall, I believe it was record attendance this year. So uh, many from our local jurisdictions, other, other school boards. And I do believe, um, it's obviously, Ms. Shires Espinosa works for CSBA. So 
she had to be there. <laughs> I pulled double duty. I represented us. But well. she did represent where I had to leave. She she was she was my wonderful stand-in and very knowledgeable in all of the issues. So um, that's the only update I have, uh, Mr. Superintendent. Uh, I just wanted to quickly say um, thank you uh, with regard to the uh, settlement with the EGA. Uh, appreciate the uh, the work that we uh, we did together um, with the leadership of the EGA the leadership of the board and giving us the direction and the uh, uh, authority to move forward so that the team um, could do the work that they needed to do. So uh, just a great job overall. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will move on to, as I stated in the beginning, the request for student expulsions was moved uh, to later here in the agenda. So I would like to ask if anyone wishes to address the board in closed session regarding a student expulsion recommendation. Seeing none, I will call for a motion to approve the request for student expulsions. I'll move in. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any no's? All right, very good. Abstain. And we do have one abstention. We'll abstain. Thank you. All right, Mr. Forcina, I'd like to call on your assistance for the approval of the consent agenda. Okay, I'd like to uh, make a motion. On, a, on the following uh, action items of consent agenda, number 16, approval of minutes, 18, personnel actions, 19, certification of administrator's competence to evaluate, 20, memorandum of understanding between assistant chief of police and Elk Grove Unified School District, 21, approval of second interim financial report, 22, approval of warrant register number 8, 23, approval of purchase order history, 24, approval of budget transfers. 25, acceptance of gifts. 26, correction of surplus school bus vehicle identification numbers. 27, ratification of contracts. 28, award of request for proposal and contract for external auditing services. 29, contact ed contract approval. 30, approval to award the bid for UPS uh, uninterrupted power supply equipment and installation. 31, quintessential school systems contract. 32 has been deleted. 33, California Montessori Charter School Annual Facilities Agreement. 34, approval of revisions to board policy. 40, 30, non-discrimination in employment. 36, new high school course approval. 36, high school mathematics, instructional materials adoption. And 37, California high school exit exam waiver requests. Thank you, Mr. Forcina. I'd like to call for a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll move it. We have a motion. Second. We and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any no's? Abstentions? Okay, very good. Well, we have no items removed, so I'd like to move on to number 39. Anything from the floor? I have just one comment, uh, Mr. Rob Pierce. On Marion Mix Elementary School, beautiful school. You see it coming up. Uh, That's pretty amazing. And it's over 90% complete. Is that correct? Yeah. The, the concern I have, I was driving by a couple of times, and I guess we didn't catch it when we went through, when we doing the model and looking at things. design, yeah. Is the, uh, the barrier, the wall, the concrete wall there, and I'm looking at the basketball courts right next to it. <laughs> I'm looking at Mr. Hoffman and, because and really? I have had an ongoing. You know, I, I was with my wife. We were driving, and we looked at. It, I said, "What if a ball goes over that? That short defense is so short, right. and there's such heavy traffic going up. What's our liability in that?" So can, I, I, um, can I ask the last time you drove by? Because the weeks. reason I'm joking—it's uh, it's really couple, not a joke. It's a, a serious matter, and so yeah. Mr. Hoffman and I. As he toured the site, it was, it was something that he asked immediately. So in working with the principal, um, <laughs> we felt there was ample basketball courts, so we actually re, um, removed the one that's farthest to the east, closest to the wall, and there will be increased tetherball opportunities for the students there. So there's now going to be a, a tetherball <laughs> barrier, if you will, between the basketball courts and the wall. There's also shrubs that we've planted on the, the west side, and I know they're low now, but they grow very rapidly. They'll be taller than the wall, but should we experience anything, we'll, we'll do a temporary measure until those shrubs are tall enough. But 
It just I, I appreciate That's why I concern. just wanted to bring that share up. It. On that. We want a balls on ropes connected to poles. <laughs> yeah. <That's laughs> okay. Be a tether wall barrier now between that. And, That's and a I gorgeous think in school. Working with Miss Clark, um, I brought it to her attention as well. So we'll make sure that the students have proper playground etiquette with their yard supervision. Yeah. And, okay. And, and You're on top of it. We're, I appreciate it because we. You. Okay. Thank glad you. Glad we're on top of it. Yes. Okay. Mr. Perez. Okay, since we're on the uh, subject of the elementary school, and I had a conversation with Mr. Pierce regarding that school and the uh, incident what I saw the other day, Saturday, in which I wasn't sure if uh, children were injured or they just fell off the bike. And it's, it's a part of the school there, which um, it's the south corner of the school, and, it, and according to the site manager, it, it's considered a shark tail turn from the corner of the property and uh, mixed, school are you mixed school? elementary. Okay. And um, so I talked to him, says, what can be done? I did a site thing. Um, so I called Elk Grove City and they meant, and I got a call today and they are going to call SMUD to fix that vault. Um, uh, I guess it's a vault uh, platform there, which is about two or three inches off the ground or inward. And so they're going to fix that. But the transition from the sidewalk uh, looping around that corner is kind of a tragic turn, a kind of a dead end. Then you have to immediately do a right turn if you're a little kid on a, you know, on a bike. And also, I, I, I foresee it maybe during the winter if that's all muddy and the kids are trampling and all that's going to be all muddy, and kids running through that area. And they mentioned that they're going to possibly look at that particular area and see if they could do some re- uh, design so or a really f a smooth transition versus this shark fin turn in that area because it's it is dangerous i have talked to the site uh Bo what's the name bozo this guy named bob bozo and he mentioned yes he agreed with it but it was in his duty as a safety uh officer of sidewalks to do that so he would have to take it to the architect mr so, price so yes. these are you know if you're before calling the city of Elk Grove? Yes. These kinds of questions need to go through our district if it's happening. I did it as a concerned city citizen on a Saturday. It happened on a Saturday. And, and, and so, uh, and that's what, you know, uh, I called uh, one of my former friends who is on the city council. And so that's what they advised me to do. Thank you. I'll be happy to look into it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mrs. So I'm nothing. just had one yeah. more announcement. Um, I sit on a committee for the annual Native American Culture Days at UC Davis, and I have the information here. Um, it's going to be April, um, the week of April 6th through April 10th, and anybody is open to the public and is welcome to attend the different workshops. And then the annual powwow will be Saturday, April 11th. So I wanted to pass out that Thank information. You. Yes, I'd like to also announce that Cesar Chavez Day at UC Davis is uh, Saturday, March, I mean, this month. The, 28th, there's over 2,500 students district-wide going to this event, getting college education, enrollment, counseling, free lunch, free breakfast. All kinds of buses are coming throughout the districts. Thank you. Hearing no other discussions from the floor, I would like to adjourn the meeting.